Hello everyone and welcome to this presentation on Charles de Gaulle. Now this presentation has been a long time in coming. It's something I planned around for about three years, but um, thematically and chronologically it never seemed rather appropriate to do it. But now I have finally decided to tackle the topic of Charles de Gaulle. Uh, Charles de Gaulle is almost endlessly fascinating to me. Uh, he's probably my most... Um, how best to describe it. He's definitely the leader of France that I'm most invested in over the last 200 years, more so than a Charles X, more so than a Comte de Chambord, the King of France who never was, uh, even more so than Napoleon III, which I believe you can draw various parallels towards de Gaulle. But I'm going to start this presentation by reading the speech, the speech which creates de Gaulle at least as far as the legend is concerned. And this is the speech given to the French forces just before the armistice on the 18th of June, 1940. The leaders who for many years have been at the head of the French armies have formed a government. This government, alleging that our armies are defeated, has made contact with the enemy to end the fighting. Certainly, we have been overwhelmed by the mechanized forces of the enemy on the ground and in the air. Infinitely more than their number, it was the tanks, the aeroplanes, the tactics of the Germans which forced us into retreat. It was the tanks, the aeroplanes, the tactics of the Germans that took our leaders by surprise to the point of bringing them to where they are today. But has the last word been said? Must hope disappear? Is the defeat definitive? No. Believe me, I am someone who speaks to you with full knowledge of the facts, and I tell you that nothing is lost for France. The same means that conquered us today can one day bring us victory. For France is not alone. She is not alone. She is not alone. She has a vast empire behind her. She can make common cause with the British Empire, which controls the seas and continues the struggle. She can, like England, use without limit the immense industry of the United States. This war is not limited to the unfortunate territory of our country. This war is not decided by the Battle of France. This war is a world war. Despite all our mistakes, all our failure to catch up, all our sufferings, there are in the world all the means necessary one day to overcome our enemies. Struck down by mechanized force, we will be able to conquer in the future by a superior mechanical force. The destiny of the world is at stake. I, General de Gaulle, currently in London, invite the officers and the French soldiers who are located in British territory or who may be in the future with their weapons or without their weapons. I invite the engineers, the special workers, the armament industries who are located in British territory or who may be in the future to contact me. Whatever happens, the flame of France, French resistance must not be extinguished and will not be extinguished. The irony for this speech the speech that created the legend of Gaul is that it was a post hoc legend. Very few people heard this speech. The speech was considered so significant at the time, made by one rebel general, one defiant general with only the tentative approval of London, that they didn't even bother to keep a recording of the original speech. But most would become aware of it, and they became aware of it by reading it. One facet of de Gaulle, which I'm going to be presenting thematically throughout this presentation, is de Gaulle's schutzpah, de Gaulle's impotence. De Gaulle here to speak for the cause of the French resistance, given the fact that de Gaulle, before he became the de Gaulle of legends, was essentially a nobody. Barely anyone had heard of him, and he only had a very minor link to the last government of the Third French Republic, being under Secretary of War. Coming back to this idea of Schutzpah, or in terms of the French variety of impotence to characterize him, I'm reminded of Napoleon's famous phrase, who saves a nation violates no law, 
And this is in reference to the fact that he is defying the legally constituted government of France, the government which he believes has discredited itself by coming into contact with the enemy, that being Germany. In many senses, he is trying to surpass the constitution of France, the institutions of France, the head of the French government, who is Pétain at this point, the National Assembly of France, to declare that he almost represents a superior law. Who actually comes to mind when focusing on this one point in 1940, this one minor brigadier general with um, this incredibly contentious legitimacy? I am actually reminded of Dostoevsky. In particular, I'm reminded of Rodia Raskolnikov, the anti-hero of crime and punishment. Rodia goes on and murders an elderly woman who is his pawnbroker, and he ultimately gives himself away to the prosecutor, or rather the detective, through an essay he'd written beforehand. In this essay, Roger had posited that some men are bound to supersede the laws of man and to essentially bend the world around them, bend it to their will, and thereby they can supersede legal systems and impose their own order, their own morality, their own philosophy. This is a pathetic justification for Roger to justify his murder, that he can step outside the normal bounds of morality. But in particular reference to Roger, Roger focuses on figures like Lycurgus, the legal founder of the state of Sparta, Solon, the respective counterpart to him in Athens, and Napoleon, three men who were able to redefine what it meant to belong to those respective states. It's not fair to say de Gaulle at this point in time, representative by his, represented here by his impudence, is as pathetic as a Roger, yet he is far beneath Napoleon. When Napoleon came to power in 1799, he had various grand victories behind him, most notably in Italy. In fact, Napoleon's rise to power in 1799 bears far closer resemblance to de Gaulle's rise to power again in 1958, not 1940. But connected to this, inseparable from the idea of de Gaulle as representing the legitimacy of the French state, is how de Gaulle viewed the world, viewing the world through nations. And for my presentation here, I've been very fortunate uh, to have been able to read a new biography of France, relatively recent, about uh, five years old, A Certain Idea of France by Julian Jackson, which in some respects exceeded my expectations. And I'm going to be reading a segment here, and I'm going to be reading various segments throughout the course of this presentation. De Gaulle's starting point was the nation state, which he viewed as the fundamental reality governing human existence. One could fill pages with quotations on this theme, from de Gaulle's talk to conscripts when he was a young lieutenant in 1913, to pronouncements uttered right up to the end of his career. This is de Gaulle in 1913. National feeling is natural to all nations and all countries. It is as natural as filial love or family feeling. Nationalism is a form of egoism, and this is de Gaulle in 1962. Peoples do not change. They do not die except if there is some terrible accident. They remain what they are with their own characteristics, with their collective temperaments, with their soul. They last as long as the olive tree. A people needs to be proud of itself. It needs to have the pride to be able to keep saying, I am the fruit of a history, which is that one and no other. For de Gaulle, history and geography always prevailed over ideology. In 1958, when John Foster Dulles was expatiating on the international communist threat from the Soviet Union and China, de Gaulle replied that Russia and China would inevitably enter into conflict. Russia, he said, on many occasions, will soak up communism as blotting paper absorbs ink. During the Vietnam War, he told an American visitor that Vietnam will become communist, but this will be an Asian communism, as there is already a Chinese communism, each to their own communisms. For de Gaulle, the conflict between nations was the eternal law of history. Like all life, he told the French people in a televised address in 1960, the life of nations is struggle, or as he said on, other, on another occasion, it is what antiquity called destiny, Bousuet called providence, Darwin 
called the law of species. Since conflict was an internal phenomenon, there was no point in regretting it, but de Gaulle did not view it as a negative. One needs adversaries to exist. One of his favorite quotations, he quoted it in a lecture to officers in 1927, was from Hamlet. To be great is to sustain a great quarrel. Shakespeare's words were slightly different. Rightly to be great is not to stir without great argument, but greatly to find quarrel in a straw when one's honor is at stake. Since life was a struggle, harmony in human affairs was not natural and was forged out of the balance of competing interest. Man, limited in his nature, is infinite in his desires. The world is full of opposing forces. Certainly human wisdom sometimes prevents these rivalries from degenerating into bloody conflicts. But the competition between these efforts is the condition of life. In the last analysis, as always, it is only in the balance of forces that the world will find peace. Now with a specific reference to France. France was, of course, involved in the struggle for existence, like any other country. But the sentimental de Gaulle seemed to exempt her from national egoism. He believed to be the motor of history. As he said in a speech in 1959, French power and grandeur are directed to the well-being and fraternity of mankind, or as he put it eight years later, our action is aimed at reaching goals that because they are French, are in the interests of mankind. And go back to probably the most famous quote by de Gaulle, France cannot be itself without grandeur. When coming up with the title for this stream, I came up with the pursuit of grandeur because I was trying to uh, add a Jeffersonian theme to this. Uh, little did I know that uh, one of Julian Jackson's uh, chapters was already called that, so he stole my thunder in many ways. But regardless, the title is still apt, so I don't mind uh, having not stolen it from him, but having landed in this happy coincidence. So going back to what I said about de Gaulle as encapsulating impudence, his impudence here is with his identification with France. France cannot be without de Gaulle. Of the five European great powers that fought in the Second World War, Germany, the Soviet Union, Britain, Italy, and France, France indisputably was the most swiftly and comprehensively defeated. And yet the French Phoenix rose to surpass all the other powers, save for the Soviet Union, within the space of two decades. Moreover, striking a defiant tone against the United States encroachments into Europe through the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It is hard to reconcile this with the situation that France found itself in 1940. Following the German victory in the Battle for France, the legal French government retreated to the spa town of Vichy, coalescing around the figure of Marshal Pétain, the victor of Verdun. Said government, the state of France, or Vichy France, inexorably drifted from cooperation with to supplication to the Germans, until finally the Vichy remnants were sequestered away by the Germans to an enclave in Sigmaringen. Conversely, this one undersecretary of war, Charles de Gaulle, would go on to establish the French National Committee, or Free France, a French government in exile based in London, a government contesting the legitimacy of the regime in Vichy. In essence, France had descended into civil war, and both factions participating in that war pegged their fortunes to the cause of their respective allies or masters. Given this context, one could safely assume that whatever side gained victory in World War II, France would have emerged truncated and with a loss of sovereignty. This was a charge that G. Monet, an ideologue and supposed founding father that I rally against that term for the Americanization of European politics, an ideologue of European unity, would level at de Gaulle himself as acting in the interests of England, G. Monet referring to de Gaulle. Nevertheless, it was de Gaulle, the prospective French client to Britain and America, and remember in his original speech, his reference to Britain, his reference to the empire, and his reference to the industrial and material might of the United States, who insisted on and achieved a miraculous recognition of France as a victorious power in World War II, with great power status bolted on as a member of the UN Security Council. It was de Gaulle who reconciled West Germany as a junior ally to France, 
while vetoing Britain's early attempts to join the EEC, the European Economic Community, that would later become the European Union. It was de Gaulle who took France out of the US-led NATO command, who established France's own nuclear deterrent, despite abandoning France's overseas empire, and most controversially of all, French Algeria. Moreover, in the domestic sphere, de Gaulle refashioned the unstable French political system into the Fifth Republic, a republic which restored a monarchy with himself at its first monarch, Le Grand Charles, or Charles XI. Monarch in the purest sense of possessing a nation, le roi de France. His particular conception of a politics for France with himself at its head, drew inspiration from a disparate and sometimes contradictory array of philosophical and historical sources. As a military historian, he attempted to reconcile the irreconcilable, the legacy of Touraine, Catinat, with Napoleon, and the revolutionary generals that had prosecuted the war in the Vendée, something that horrified his legitimist father, Henry de Gaulle. His political thought encompassed aspects of Catholic legitimism, Orleanism, Bonapartism, Republicanism, and even Pitonism or Vichyism, sublimating doctrine to his certain idea of France if France in itself could be considered an ideology. Nevertheless, de Gaulle was the target of multiple assassination attempts, coup d'etat, and what amounted to a revolution, an upheaval all too reminiscent of France's unique propensity to jettison regimes with each turn of the circle. Yet the Fifth Republic survived him, and Gaullism, post de Gaulle, is a broad church, embraced by elements of both the left and the right, I would say conveniently to suit their motives at the time. The thumbnail for the stream shows then President de Gaulle with a Joan of Arc reenactor. It is no surprise perhaps that Churchill once referred to de Gaulle as Joan of Arc in trousers. I have long been drawn to this figure of de Gaulle as I mentioned at the beginning of this stream and I generally hold him in high regard when compared to his contemporaries, particularly his contemporaries in Britain, you of course know who I'm talking about, uh, Churchill through to Harold Macmillan and even Wilson. Indeed, you can almost say that de Gaulle represents an antidote to the British politicians of that era, at least as far as I'm concerned. Indeed, here my aim is to ascertain to what extent it can be said that de Gaulle, the legend, saved France in a manner of Joan of Arc. De Gaulle was born in Lille in 1890 to Henry de Gaulle. Uh, it should be noted when de Gaulle delivered his speech, of course, he wasn't a well-known character. And many actually assumed that de Gaulle wasn't his real name. They assumed that de Gaulle was a pseudonym, i.e. literally the Gaulle. Uh, they believed it was too perfect, almost a bit too much on the nose. There is even one anecdote of one young French writer at the time having pursued uh, to no avail a nom de plume uh, to write his novels. And then when de Gaulle hit him, he thought, perfect, but it's been stolen from me. Um, and of course, as a result of this, no one quite knew how to spell the name de Gaulle. However, it isn't so prescient that he was called de Gaulle. The origin, uh, given the northern French background of the de Gaulles, uh, is most likely from the Flemish word uh, de Valle, uh, the wall, and not the de Gaulle, um, the Gaulle of uh, pre-Frankish civilization. The de Gaulles were a literary family. De Gaulle's grandparents were writers and historians. In fact, de Gaulle's grandmother, in particular, was a prolific author, having penned 80 books. The de Gaulle family were by inclination legitimists who venerated the legacy of the Comte de Chambord and lamented the formation of France's Third Republic. And by that, they looked to the white flag controversy, the demise of MacMahon's moral order, and the rise of factors such as uh, Gambetta and Le Marseillaise, the attempt to reconcile the aspects of the original revolutionary First Republic as morally abhorrent. In this respect, you can say that the Gauls were part of the most reactionary of reactionary factions in France, more reactionary than the Bonapartists and the Orleanists, um, in terms of this own, my own conception of what could be considered ultra-royalism, 
um, but of course legitimism in the French sense as being applied to the specific case of the royalty of France. Of course, the legitimists found themselves in an odd position in the 1880s, given the fact that Comte de Chambord um, essentially ended the line of French legitimists and afterwards many monarchists in France pegged their hopes to uh, the Count of Paris, the Orléanist claimant, and very much Charles de Gaulle would actually reference this back. I may actually come to this point. Uh, we'll see how this goes. De Gaulle himself regarded his family as landed gentry, the descendant of the 17th century noblesse de robe, i.e. those who were essentially bought into the service of Louis XIV, not hereditary nobility. But nevertheless, the noblesse de robe for de Gaulle has a particular noble conception in the sense that it represents a uh, legacy of service to France. For de Gaulle, the gentry had a conception of loyalty that was absent in the urban moneyed bourgeoisie and, by contrast, what he considered to be the debauched Parisian aristocracy. Despite the family's attachment to the northern French countryside, in fact that de Gaulle spent most of the 19th century living in Paris, and much of de Gaulle's life would also be spent there. But before moving on to his military career, I want to specify something in particular, another facet which um, draws me to de Gaulle among many, which is to talk about his own personal Catholicism, given this family background and his own, uh, you can say, uh, osmosis or rather diffusion regarding um, uh, French legitimism. There are also some qualifiers to add to that, which is around about the time he was born, France was embroiled in the Dreyfus affair. The anti-Dreyfusards tended to be militaristic French Catholics, and the Dreyfusards uh, tended to be um, socialists and republicans. But one of the characteristics that defined the Alfred Dreyfus affair was uh, anti-Jewishness, because Alfred Dreyfus uh, was a Jew. And very conveniently for de Gaulle, Henry de Gaulle is presented as reactionary, but he's also presented as being a Dreyfusard somewhat of a fundamental contradiction, considering I think the Dreyfus affair was the uh, propelling force behind the separation of church and state in France. But nevertheless, de Gaulle could essentially claim both factions for himself, or at least conveniently. And this is another facet which I draw attention to at the beginning, which is de Gaulle being able to sublimate all of these supposedly contradictory philosophies to his own particular conception of France. And this is going back to Jackson. Throughout his life, de Gaulle, he remained punctilious in his religious observance. When he became president of France in 1958, he installed a chapel in the Elysee Palace so he could attend mass privately, if he was in Paris over the weekend. But the ostentatious adolescent piety in de Gaulle had displayed at Antoine was not characteristic of de Gaulle in adulthood. Beyond his external respect for the rituals of Catholicism, his relationship to religion was mysterious. Those observing him at mass were struck by how distracted he always seemed to be, peering around to see who was present, looking out of the windows, visibly bored of the ceremony dragged on. The novelist, André Malraux, commented, he talks often of France, but never of God. His aides were sometimes discuss among themselves whether he was really a believer at all, and what kind of believer he might be. Some took the view he was a Catholic rather than a Christian, meaning that, like the agnostic Charles Maurras, the founder of Axiom Francaise, he believed in the Catholic Church as the institution which embodied France in his history. That would also uh, put him alongside Napoleon. He gave some credence to this idea when remarking one day to one of his nephews, I am Christian and Catholic by history and geography. But others in his presence sensed a profound, if discreet, Christian faith. All his life he demonstrated remarkable theological confidence. His niece, uh, Genevieve remembered once that when the Archbishop of Rouen expressed his regret at having broken the host during communion, de Gaulle replied that Christ was present in all fragments of the host. One day, walking back from Mass in December of 1946, he launched into a long monologue to his aide-de-camp about the importance of Christ's sacrifice to the meaning of Christianity. De Gaulle, he opened up the horizons of religion beyond the heart of men towards vast regions, giving a place to human suffering, to human anguish, to human dignity. This expression of open religious med meditation on de Gaulle's part is remarkable for being unique. Perhaps he was also thinking about himself when he wrote of Marshall Foch in the essay cited above. He was profoundly croyant without ever mixing his religion with his professional activities, it nonetheless remained a vital element of his interior life, 
his personality was, it were, as it were, impregnated by it. If de Gaulle ever suffered religious doubts, we have no record of them, although at times he expressed sentiments of almost nihilistic pessimism. He often repeated Stalin's comment to him in 1944, in the end, only death wins. He also liked to cite an aphorism from Nietzsche, nothing is worth anything, nothing happens, and yet everything occurs, but this is a matter of indifference. A diffuse Nietzscheanism was in vogue around French intellectuals during de Gaulle's youth, but one writer's attempt to enroll de Gaulle as a Nietzschean Christian, whatever that might be, is not convincing at all. What is certain is that de Gaulle's Catholicism was inseparable from his patriotism and his sense of France. He would often refer to the 1500 years of the history of France. When asked the significance of that number, he told one of his biographers, for me, the history of France begins with Clovis, who was chosen as King of France by the tribe of the Franks, who gave their name to France. Before Clovis, we have the Gallo-Roman and Gaulish histories. The deciding element for me is that Clovis was the first king to be baptized a Christian. Mine is a Christian country, and I count the history of France from the ascension of a Christian king who bore the name of the Franks, bore the name of France. In the 19th century, dating the origins of France was an intensely political issue. Conservatives harked back to the baptism of Clovis, 1,500 years. The Republicans looked to Verts and Geterix, who led the Gaulish revolt against the Romans in 52 BC, 2,000 years. De Gaulle sometimes used the latter figure, especially during the war, when a struggle of the Gauls provided a parallel with the resistance, but less often than he referred to France's 1,500 years. In the history of France, the period with which de Gaulle was most out of sympathy was the anti-religious and free-thinking enlightenment, when, as he wrote in the 1930s, scepticism and corruption dissolve loyalty and paralyzed authority. Voltaire was an author whose corrosive irony he particularly deplored, often citing his verses as proof that French intellectuals have always betrayed France. Of France's 19th century writers, none were more revered by de Gaulle than the romantic René de Chateaubriand, whose Gêne du Christianisme played a role in the return to Catholicism of the French bourgeoisie, including families like his own after the revolution, Chateaubriand being one of the preeminent thinkers during the restoration period in the 1820s and 30s, or rather the 1820s. Occasionally, de Gaulle's speeches would make explicit reference to the Catholic roots of France. At a rally of the RPF, the um, Rally of the People of France, the political movement he founded in 1947, he, he proclaimed, come to us, you who are animated by the flame of Christianity, that which casts lights of love and fraternity over the valley of human suffering, that which sparks the spiritual and moral values which have inspired France over the centuries. Once he had returned to power in 1958 as president of a formerly secular state, formerly as instituted by the separation of church and state in 1906, he avoided such overtly religious language. Even so, his quasi-mystical nationalism was saturated by his religious sensibility. For him, religion and patriotism, service to the fatherland and God were indistinguishable. As we have seen, the first page of his war memoirs compare France to a Madonna fresco. His war speeches, which he referred to in his memoirs as a sort of priestly duty, often invoked Our Lady of France. Nothing matters to us, and nothing preoccupies us more than to serve her. Our duty to her is as simple and elementary as the duty of a son to an oppressed mother. We have nothing other than to ask from her, except perhaps that on the day of victory, she opens maternally her arms to us so that we can cry with joy, and that on the day when death comes to claim us, she enfolds us gently in her good and holy earth. So moving on to de Gaulle's career. De Gaulle entered the army, served in the First World War, and fought in the Battle of Verdun in 1915 under, who would later be, Marshal Pétain, only to be captured by the Germans and sent to prison of war camp in Bavaria, where he spent the remainder of the war, nearly three years. His long incarceration caused de Gaulle to lecture his fellow officers in military history and geopolitics, so representing his formative years as a theoretician and historian. In fact, if you go back to the original speech, he is very much construing his theory of resistance around that of the theory of mechanized warfare 
that is his background in the military of France. With the armistice, de Gaulle was now free again, but he was conscious of the fact that his career advancement had been delayed and so took an opportunity to supervise the creation of the new Polish army. While in Poland, de Gaulle witnessed the Soviet-Polish war and the Polish miracle on the Vistula, preventing the Red Army from taking Warsaw. De Gaulle would go on to spend part of his interwar career in Lebanon, then part of the French mandate, as a part of the larger French colonial empire. His ambivalence towards the French administration in the Middle East is often taken as a cue for his later decision to abandon Algeria, though de Gaulle could hardly be viewed here as a committed anti-colonialist, which some have claimed. When he returned to Paris, de Gaulle became an early exponent of the creation of mobile tank armies, using arguments reminiscent of those of Guderian and Tukhachevsky. Indeed, de Gaulle would take the credit for inspiring the mode of warfare that would later become known as Blitzkrieg. And I have to point out that de Gaulle was remarkably prophetic in many of his points. At the beginning of this lecture, we referenced the idea that each country has its own iteration of communism. He accurately predicted the Sino-Soviet splits years before it would occur. He was an early exponent of something resembling blitzkrieg warfare. And indeed, when it comes to his later foreign policy pronouncements, they do all seem to be indicative of this uh, remarkable prophesizing ability, which I think speaks more to his historical side all of these references, especially to the idea of the, admi the admonition against him, that he was a Catholic more so than being a Christian, is that his entire conception of himself and his conception of France is rooted in history. It seems rather ironic that I'm discussing de Gaulle having just uh, reviewed Putin's uh, history of Ukraine, but nevertheless, I think the more sort of astute of you will be able to see some parallels here in terms of a rigid form of self-serving nationalism combined with a love and veneration of history, an entire worldview informed by a love of history. Nevertheless, de Gaulle argued that while advocating, uh, advoca essentially de Gaulle argued this, i.e. Blitzkrieg, while advocating for the creation of a professional French army, this at a time when France had a conscript army, that same conscript army that had led France to victory in the First World War against Germany. Thus de Gaulle cut a solitary figure, arguing in vain against what was then the prevailing orthodoxy. By now, de Gaulle had declared that his former military patron, Marshal Piton, was dead, or rather dead to him. It was remarkable that de Gaulle, even with his career setback during the Great War, continued to advance a pace in the army, despite his ostentatious and at times insubordinate attitude towards his superiors. An infamous exchange took place during the battle for France between him and General Vegond. Vegond was then France's commanding general, following the removal of Maurice Gamelin, a former chief of staff and minister of defence. De Gaulle had been freshly appointed to the rank of Brigadier General and then Under Secretary of Defence. As de Gaulle and Vagon's military positions began to diverge, as defeat seemed inevitable, de Gaulle dressed down Vagon, declaring, The government of France does not discuss, it is to be obeyed. There's some reference of a two star general dressing down a five star general who had only weeks before been his superior. De Gaulle was tall at six foot five when the average height in France at that time was five foot three. In fact, I wouldn't even regard him as tall, I would regard him as a giant. Despite his ungainly appearance, notably his small head that lacked a chin, it was his height that people remembered and with which he would routinely exploit as a means of intimidation. With his menacing physical presence, his taciturnity, aloofness and imperiousness to those under his command, he was the opposite of a charismatic personality. Nevertheless, as with, say, for example, Napoleon, the military became increasingly politicized as the civilian government of the Third French Republic lurched from catastrophe to catastrophe. And here I'm referring back to Jackson to give an overview of de Gaulle's political beliefs at that time. And this is around the the age of 40, 44 rather. One way of approaching de Gaulle's political beliefs at this time 
is for an exchange with his father, who before his death had been reading the manuscript of the French history of the army de Gaulle was writing for Piton. At one point in his text, de Gaulle had made some appreciative remarks about Hoche, one of the most brilliant generals of the French Revolution, who had carried out massacres of royalists during the Vendée uprising of 1793. This led de Gaulle's father to comment, Hoche does not seem to me to merit this universal praise. He regretted that his son had shown so much sympathy for those who guarded the doors of the abattoirs while the victims were having their throats cut. At another point, de Gaulle mentioned Dumouriez, a general who had helped the Republican armies win at the Battle of Jemap in 1792, before going over to the side of the counter-revolutionaries. De Gaulle wrote of Dumouriez's treason. His father amended this to defection, which de Gaulle retained, suggesting that he had some sympathy with Dumouriez's action. These might seem flimsy foundations upon which to erect an interpretation of de Gaulle's politics, but in France, the way people viewed the past was central to their political identities. His father's rebuke that he was showing excessive indulgence to the revolution is another sign of de Gaulle distancing himself from the conservatism of his parents, more particularly his legitimism. Given de Gaulle's admiration for Poqui, a, uh, you can say, I almost don't have time to go into the philosophy of Poqui because that would make a, um, a stream in and of itself, but nevertheless, um, he represents a very sort of distinct version of French nationalism, uh, which you could even consider radical Republican or left wing in terms of the context of the early 20th century. His inclusive view, de Gaulle's inclusive view of French past, so different from the more doctrinaire positions of Maras, i.e. Action Francaise, is not so surprising. I will also note that um, I have, I think, promised at one point to do finally do a stream on Axiom Francaise. I think really that's the one thing regarding this whole topic revolving around the history of um, French legitimism and the French right that I haven't really tackled. Um, I'm not sure how I will, considering chronologically I've sort of breezed through that period, but um, that's something definitely to consider at one point to add more context to that comment. On the other hand, this had not prevented de Gaulle sending his first book to Maras personally, dedicated with his respectful homage. He also sent Maras a copy of Towards a Professional Army, following it up a few weeks later with a letter to the military correspondent of Action Francaise, expressing his hope that Mr. Mor Monsieur Maras will bring his powerful support to the professional army. In truth, he has been doing so for a long time, already at least, though through his body of doctrines. At the same time, however, de Gaulle was a member of the three thinking mayor circle, presided over by someone who was a Jew and a former Dreyfusard, representing everything the Action Francaise ex execrated. In the mayor circle, de Gaulle had encountered some of those young intellectuals, mostly born around 1905, whom historians had dubbed, for want of a better label, the non-conformists of the 1930s. They were an eclectic group, who had little in common except the conviction that existing political labels had no purchase on contemporary problems. They were united by a haunting a sense of disenchantment with contemporary politics, a diffuse, sorry, and a, a diffuse set of um, ideas. Uh, he also met the young intellectual Robert Aron, who met, who with his friend Arnold Dandieu, had founded a small review called The New Order, whose main theme was that politics, whether of the right or the left, was caught in the same trap of materialism, liberal capitalism, and Marxist socialism, where merely mirror images of each other. This brought the New Order close to the ideas of the Catholic personalist philosophy of Emmanuel Monnier, whose solution to the crisis of civilization was to advocate communitarian forms of socialist organis of social organization to escape from the dead end of liberal individualism, and this may seem counterintuitive, but Monnier uh, has been covered before in this channel, uh, and he's been covered on a stream about Vietnam, <laughs> uh, if people want to check that one out. One of Monnier's mottos was that liberal democracy, at least as practiced in France, was a kind of institutionalized disorder. The aspiration towards order, though not necessarily in an authoritarian sense, was much in vogue in these later circles. 
The future trajectories of the so-called nonconformists would later take them in markedly different political directions, but they all shared the sense, as de Gaulle wrote to a correspondent in 1935, that the world is trembling on the basis that we have, no we have known up until now. If de Gaulle was, through his parents, linked to the generation of the 1870s and by his birth to the generation of 1905, the 1930s generation also marked his thinking durably. We shall see this later in regard to de Gaulle's social ideas about finding a middle way, a third way, between capitalism and socialism. But because the nonconformists had such varied future political trajectories, we are no further advanced in answering concrete questions about de Gaulle's political beliefs in the mid-1930s. What did he think about Mussolini, the popular French, the French fascist leagues, the Spanish Civil War? His letters are silent on all of these topics. Up to a point, this silence is in itself revealing. His letters contain none of the standard obsessions of what was then the French right, that there was a Jewish conspiracy to undermine France, in fact, he never mentions Jews, that the Popular Front was leading France to revolution, that the Republicans in Spain were raping nuns, but nor do they contain any condemnation of the leagues or express concerns about threats to democracy posed by the riots of the 6th of February 1934. Indeed, de Gaulle's response to these riots seemed entirely positive. Today, the ground under us is giving way. Since February, when the volcano erupted, all is upheaval, in truth, this is nothing less than the start of a revolution. Where will it lead? In my humble opinion, to a reinforcing or even better, a restoration of order, but not without many more upheavals. In any case, the old republic of committees, elections, and personal favours is in its death throes, agony. It is giving way to altogether different ideas. We are entering a kind of 1848 in reverse. In my review, the issue is this. Whether the change occurs without there being too many victims and without leading to a foreign invasion. This excitable language puts de Gaulle squarely in the camp of those of the right who saw the events of the 6th of February as a salutary challenge to parliamentary democracy, but it is not clear what positive alternative he favoured. If one tries to place de Gaulle's view of politics in a longer perspective, two themes stand out. The first was preoccupation with a rational, the word recurs often as writing organization of society. The need for more rationally organized state was an idea shared widely across the political spectrum in the pre-war years by those dissatisfied with the inadequacies of the working of the parliamentary republic. It was the critique underlining Robert de Juvenel's classic text, The Repub Le Republic Camarade, or the writings of the center-right political theorist, Charles Benost. Ben Wast. Both these authors are cited in de Gaulle's notebooks. The Juvenel's book, published in 1914, had lambasted the politicians of the Parliamentary Republic as an isolated caste, cut off from the realities of the nation. Its most famous observation was that two deputies of different parties always had more in common with each other than with their electors. Benoist was a conservative Republican whose disillusion with democracy had led him to move progressively towards Action Francaise. During the war, a new strand was added to this concern with rational organization. This was the idea that the organization of the state could be improved by adopting the methods of modern industry. Two names were often cited in this respect. One of them was Henry Fayol and the American F.W. Taylor, both popularizers of the theory of management science. Mayer was a great admirer of Fayol. And although there is no direct mention of Fayol in de Gaulle's writings, he does display a fascination with what he dubbed the Taylorization of society, mass production, mass spectator sport, modern advertising, both because of the threat it posed and because of the lessons it offered. Play and our desires are haunted by machines. In Towards a Professional Army, de Gaulle wrote, the gap between the expectations of society and the sclerosis of the social system has become so flagrant that it will soon need to be overcome. Our generation, which is obsessed with efficiency, with horsepower, records, series, mass production, specialist, cost prices, our era which is so eager for clarity, for naked lights, clean lines, hygiene, women in bathing costumes, our century which sets such store on displays of strength, competition, 
cartels, elites, propaganda, and nationalism will no longer put up with the slowness, the confusion, and weakness with which earlier periods were ready to accept. One historical figure who exemplified de Gaulle's idea of a rational organizer was Louis XIV's war minister, de Marquis de Lavoie, the, main, the man responsible for the modernization of the Ancien Régime army. To his mother, de Gaulle wrote in 1919, we have a great need of a Lavoie or a Richelieu. It is worth quoting de Gaulle's portrait of Lavoie in the history of the French army he had been writing for Pétain. Disdaining theories, he was careful not to disrupt or destroy but as a realist, he never ceased in his efforts to reform and improve. Though obstinate in pursuing his ends, he was capable of being flexible. An enthusiastic planner, he knew also how to bide, to, how to bide his time. Unencumbered by scruples, he used whatever means seemed simplest and most expedient. His, his was severe in his judgments of men, while not despising them. Clear-sighted, without being sceptical, devoid of illusions, while not lacking faith, he was implacable regarding incompetence. He was distant, but also approachable, ready to read reports, while in the end making his own judgments, welcoming advice, but jealously keeping the final decision for himself. He had enemies and allies, but he had no friends. Lavoie operated in the structured and hierarchical society of the French monarchy that was forever lost, except in the minds of Action Francaise and Maras. But while de Gaulle's view of the organization of society was, like Maras, unashamedly elitist, words like freedom and democracy do not figure in his writings in this period, he knew he was living in a world where the antique deference to authority no longer existed. A second strand of de Gaulle's thinking was the need for leadership in a society of mass politics, a society fashioned by industrialization and standardization, and suspicious of individuality, the civilization of the termite heap, as de Gaulle called it. De Gaulle was also influenced by the writings of one social theorist, Gustave Le Bon, whose, an whose analysis of crown psychology influenced figures as various as Theodore Roosevelt, Mussolini, Sigmund Freud, and Hitler. For Le Bon, crowds in modern urban society were irrational and malleable. Their emotions needed to be harnessed and manipulated by leaders who knew how to exploit their irrationality. De Gaulle quoted Le Bon in his notebooks, and in 1916, after reading an article by him on the revolution, he wrote, Le Bon refutes the legend of the divine people, always sacrosanct in its follies, its crimes, and notes that people during the French Revolution were effectively and continuously led. De Gaulle's thoughts on prestige, which we might translate as charismatic leadership in the edge of the sword, read like direct citations from Le Bon. One does not stir up crowds other than by elementary sentiments, violent images, brutal invocations. Men cannot do without being led, any more than they can do without eating, drinking and sleeping. Leaders had to be able to stir the imagination and excite the latent faith of the masses. The leader's authority is not susceptible to rational analysis any more than love, which is inexplicable, only as an action of inexpressible charm. In short, the leader was a master towards whom people's faith and dreams are, direct, are directed. De Gaulle wrote, A very good exercise from a statesman who is not too sure of himself, confusing history with politics. There is intelligence and a savoir-faire, but one looks for the grandeur, the elevation, the summits of courage, which Clemenceau several times attained. Poincaré is a man of texts and mechanically organized intelligence. One nowhere sees in his book that he had any intuitive perception of France in 1914. He speaks to us only of ministers, of diplomats, the Senate, the Chamber, when these insignificant entities played just walk on parts. And again, this phrase is very reve revealing when it comes to his constitutionalism, or rather his disdain of certain constitutional settlements, his ability to pragmatically settle and bend certain legal systems to his will, or indeed the idea to jettison them. There is no sense, I believe, in which de Gaulle ever thought legalistically about power. Indeed, if he had a legalistic conception of being able to attain France and identify, identify France with a constitution, he would never have been able to claim power for himself. Indeed, instead mocking this idea when he was president of the council before president of the Fifth French Republic by saying, oh well, France has had 17 constitutions up to this time. What does it matter if we create another one? 
If we combine all these pieces, de Gaulle's political idea in the mid-1930s seemed to combine elitist and managerial authoritarianism with charismatic leadership. In practical terms, this could have led him in many different directions, which had little in common with parliamentary democracy. But the path he did take was determined by two other factors, his discovery of a new patron who happened to be a key player in the existing political system, and his disgust at the stance taken by many conservatives in the face of a resurgent Germany. The patron he's referring to is one Paul Renault, who would come to be Prime Minister of France in the later stages of the phony war, and ultimately be Prime Minister of France during the invasion before he was replaced by Marshal Pétain. The period regarding his reflections on the growth of Germany, because obviously in 1933, Hitler comes to power. In 1935, Germany begins to rearm. The Saarland, which most notably was effectively a French protectorate, albeit one that was afforded the right of a referendum to join Germany uh, after a period of time. It decides to do so in 1935. And in 1936, Germany reoccupies the Rhineland. Now, all of this had a particular effect on de Gaulle, because you can say that de Gaulle was one of the hardliners when it came to the stipulations, the Treaty of Versailles, uh, the defeat, uh, the settlement that was imposed on Germany after the war. Because as, of course, cognizant of, you can say, the history of France's natural borders and the strategic significance of the Rhine, he looked to the left bank of the Rhine and perhaps viewed it as France's natural frontier. And so any border that didn't essentially permanently demilitarize the Rhine or in many ways allow it to be attached to France was simply an invitation for the Germans to attempt to reobtain what they had lost in the First War. De Gaulle is very consistent on the theme that the peace imposed at Versailles was simply a prelude to a future war, very much echoing the statements of um, his one-time political patron, one Winston Churchill, in viewing this not as two separate conflicts, but as a 30 years war, a second European 30 years war, uh, with a 20 year armistice between them. It can be said, therefore, that de Gaulle's particular focus on Germany the idea that France was not in a secure enough position to be able to prevent the re-emergence of a strong Germany very much informs his views. And again, this is a post-political view because many on the conservative right, especially the legacy of the anti-Dreyfusards, they looked to Germany and thought, preferably, Germany will leave France alone. We can come to some new accommodation. You can say a form of the Lacrano Pact. The Lacrano Pact was um, in the 1920s, the government of the Third Republic and the uh, foreign ministry in Germany of Gustav Stresemann normalizes uh, the relations after the Treaty of Versailles. Um, you can almost say that there is to be a new understanding between elements of the French right, perhaps led by uh, Pierre Laval, who would later become a prime minister under Vichy, uh, and allow Germany to head eastwards, expand and focus on Lebensraum, and principally defeat the forces of Bolshevism and world communism, because domestically, communism was a very powerful force in French politics and remained so throughout the entirety of de Gaulle's career, really up until the ascent of Mitterrand, when Mitterrand is essentially able to neuter the effect of the political communism and sublimated aspects of the French Socialist Party. But these are all tenets of which more ideologically uh, defined figures within French political life would attach a foreign policy, i.e. a foreign policy which is informed by doctrinaire ideology. But because de Gaulle was not focused purely on ideology, he was focused on nationalism, he was focused on great power competition, uh, and he was focused on history. Uh, he doesn't look at Germany and say, well, national socialism is more conducive to us than Bolshevism. Instead, he says, well, Germany and France are adversarial powers. They are focused in this struggle, this great contest for supremacy. And due to the you can say, lax implementation of the stipulations of the Treaty of Versailles, Hitler is able to accrue an advantage and an advantage which we are not able to essentially meet. And the turning point for him would be in 1936. Uh, James is asking in the chat, how does focused on nationalism not involve ideology of some sort? Uh, because he believes ideology is always sublimated to history and nationalism. Uh, he believes that Bolshevism isn't necessarily representative of communism per se, but Bolshevism is simply an iteration of Russian nationalism in the same way that national socialism is an iteration of uh, 
uh, of uh, German nationalism. Uh, in this case, he simply almost views this, these as power blocks. You know, we should review uh, relations with France and relations with Germany uh, within the context of France's great power game in terms of realpolitik, you can say, uh, without being necessarily ideologically deterministic in terms of allying to one power or another. But nevertheless, de Gaulle wasn't exactly um, favorable towards the USSR either, obviously. Um, he had no sort of love of Bolshevism or of national socialism, uh, given his uh, peculiar stance on doctrines. Um, he was more or less focused on the revitalization of the Little Entente, the system of small power alliances focused around the powers of Czechoslovakia, Romania, Yugoslavia, essentially whose borders were created by the interference of France and the treaties of Paris, um, and whose essentially political geography was designed uh, to prevent the re-emergence of Austria, of Hungary, and indeed of Germany. It was essentially a French cabal in the Balkans, uh, which could also prevent the expansion of the Soviet Union. If we look at Romania's borders, for example, uh, they expand into what is now modern Ukraine in the Bukovina and the southern Bessarabia and Moldova. Nevertheless, attached to this also is the fundamental consideration of Poland and the, you can say the French propping up the idea of an intermarium of all these little states from the Baltic through to the Black Sea and the Adriatic, uh, which can act as a buffer to both the expansion of Germany and Italy on the one hand, uh, fascism and national socialism, and of Bolshevism on the other. However, again, in terms of his realistic conception of these power alliances, um, he was prepared to look at this again, not necessarily from a doctrinaire point of view that Poland is in some way France's natural ally, but sees that as a result of his own background as serving in Poland in the uh, late uh, 1910s and the early 1920s, uh, that the Polish were not an effective as force as many in the French high command believed they would be. In fact, the sort of common appraisal of the Polish military situation in 1939 was that the Polish army uh, was far more powerful and prepared than it really was, that it would be able to hold out against the Germans uh, for at least six months uh, in the event it only held out against the Germans for roughly five weeks. So with this conception, of course, we finally come to Germany invading Poland in 1939. I have to change the slide here. Uh, Poland invaded as Germany invading Poland in 1939 and the French and the British declaration of war. At the point of war, de Gaulle, at the point of the invasion in May of 1940, uh, de Gaulle is put in charge of a mechanized corps in the French army. Uh, he has a modest record, uh, to be fair. It's an unexceptional performance, and he's uh, dealt five defeats by the Germans during this time uh, within a relatively sp a short span of a few weeks uh, before being committed to the government as one of the hawks against Germany. Uh, effectively, you can say that de Gaulle um, and his appointment as undersecretary of the war in the uh, French government was a belated attempt to shore up some sense of fighting morale, as indeed was the original intention of Lebrun, president of France, appointing Pétain as uh, the last prime minister of the French Third Republic as a means of shoring up the morale at the same time that the French army was collapsing. Um, and indeed, you can say the political considerations of these various appointments always sort of rang key. I mean, why does Maurice Gamelin, um, why is Maurice Gamelin placed in charge of the French army? Um, more or less because he was seen as loyal to the French Third Republic. Uh, these are less issues of competency than they are issues of um, uh, political alignment of these various generals and what they represent. Pétain can represent Maréchal, the Le Victor de Verdun, um, and uh, de Gaulle represents a rising star within the French army. Uh, I believe at this point he is the youngest brigadier general in the French army. Uh, again, that's not much of a uh, consideration given how ancient many of the French generals were at that time, including the then commanding general after Maurice Gamelin, uh, one, one uh, General Végant. And it is here that de Gaulle really begins his period of inception in terms of becoming a legend, because here he is still a relatively obscure thinker. He is a theorist and a military historian uh, who has been read and has been in the service of uh, Piton and in the French government. He has occupied some uh, specific social circles, leaning more or less towards right-wing authoritarian elitist ideas, but nevertheless not doctrinaire as being imposed on one certain aspect of um, uh, French political thought, especially that of Action Francaise. But 
this comes to de Gaulle's most important consideration, which is why doesn't he align with the rightists who effectively go on to form the Vichy regime? And it should be obvious that de Gaulle is obsessed about defeatism. He is obsessed about the idea of France being a victorious power, no matter the cost. During this time where Vegond is pushing against de Gaulle uh, for an armistice, given the hopelessness of the situation of France and the essentially the um, effects of reprisals at the Peace of Compiègne, yes, North and Western France is occupied by Germany for the duration of the war. However, the French colonial empire remains intact. And indeed, it allows the French government to go south and consolidate and prevent what they consider to be a collapse of social order, something they've been preparing for with consideration to the collapse of order with the Paris Commune following the Franco-Prussian War in 1870 and 1871. But de Gaulle is not thinking like this. De Gaulle instead opts tentatively to support a plan, essentially a Brittany bridgehead, to allow for the French army to retreat to the West West and allow for some connection between France and Britain to allow there to be a continuation of a continental front. Um, this plan is ultimately shelved and the last ditched attempt by the Allies and uh, to essentially keep France in the war is actually to create a union of the governments of France and England. Given the fact that de Gaulle wasn't fundamentally opposed to this should also indicate his desperation that he was prepared to sublimate the constitutional settlement, the political system of France, essentially to an unequal relationship in which France would essentially be reorganized as part of the British Empire. Um, such was his desire to continue the fight. But nevertheless, we finally come here to de Gaulle's flight. And here again, I am reading uh, from Julian Jackson, if you uh, bear with me for a second. In his war memoirs, de Gaulle writes of this moment in his life. I appear to myself alone and deprived of everything, like a man on the edge of an ocean that he was hoping to swim across. I felt that a life was ending a life that I had lived in the framework of a solid France and an indivisible army. At the age of 49, I was entering into an adventure. And this is actually a specific reference to one General Boulanger. Uh, Boulanger, who essentially was another figure like Napoleon, Napoleon III, uh, with which many of the um, contenders and indeed the critics of de Gaulle would often compare him to, Boulanger being a... Uh, I, I hate to say sort of left wing or right wing, but more of a maverick populist general uh, after the demise of uh, Mac Mahon's uh, moral order in the 1870s. It is indeed hard to exaggerate the extraordinary nature of the steps that de Gaulle was taking. Equipped with two suitcases and a small stock of francs, he was heading for a country in which he had set foot for the first time 10 days earlier, whose language he spoke badly and where he knew almost no one. He was going into exile. Since the French Revolution, exile has had only a negative connotation in French political culture. In the notebook he kept while a prisoner of war, de Gaulle referred to a phrase from Tocqueville, the malady of exile which teaches nothing and immobilizes the intelligence. As the French revolutionary leader Georges Danton proclaimed in March of 1794, one does not carry the fatherland on the, soul, on the soles of one's shoes. The philosophy Raymond Arnaud Aron, who spent the war in London, remarked, the idea of defending France from the outside remained abstract because there was no memory, no tradition to support it. Exile in French memory is associated with those émigré aristocrats who had cut themselves off from the national community by fleeing abroad to Germany or Britain. In French Republican demonology, the term émigré of Koblenz summons up an image of squabbling elites cut off from the patrie from the fatherland. The monarchist tradition of de Gaulle's family did not view exile so negatively. De Gaulle himself has spent a year in quote-unquote exile when sent to complete his school in, uh, schooling in Antoine in Belgium. That experience offered a model of exile not as treason but as fidelity to one's conscience. Nevertheless, this was odds with the dominant French tradition. One of the most prominent members of the Free French in London opened his memoirs we were never emigres. Never for us was London a kind of Koblenz, even a Republican Koblenz. There were certainly were emigres in London, but they were not with us. Their intrigues, their plotting in grand hotels never affected us. <laughs>
The core of Pétain's appeal to the French people in 1914 was his decision to remain on French soil, to defend his compatriots, to defend, defend French lives, while de Gaulle left France to defend what he later called his idea of France. The conflict between those conceptions of patriotic duty was remarkably anticipated in the 1920s in an exchange between the two men over the wording of a passage in the manuscript of the book that would become France and her army. De Gaulle had written that the revolution had made France's generals the victim of political upheavals, which had deprived them of prestige, often of life, sometimes of honour. Pétain amended this to deprive them of prestige, sometimes of honour, often of life. De Gaulle annotated Pétain's correction. It is an ascending hierarchy, prestige, life, honour. Honour or life, protecting an idea of France, or protecting or believing that one was protecting the French. That was the nub of the conflict between Pétain and de Gaulle in 1940. When did de Gaulle come to the decision that to save France he would have to leave France? In 1942, he told the British diplomat that it was on the 13th of June, the night he wrote his letter of resignation that he had felt treachery in the air for the first time, and thereupon made his decision. But when de Gaulle left for England on the 15th of June, the ultimate destination he had in mind was French North Africa, not London. The purpose of going to London had been to prepare for a move by Reynolds' government to North Africa. Seeing his wife briefly before setting off, he made no mention of a move to London. The decision to leave for London came once Reynaud's government had fallen. De Gaulle's decision was a combination of reflection and instinct, similar to what he had analysed in The Edge of the Sword. He is often credited with prophetic lucidity for predicting that the Battle of France was only the first stage in the World War that the Allies could win. But that analysis had also underpinned Reynaud's attempt to oppose the armistice. What is remarkable about de Gaulle in 1940 is not so much his intellectual analysis of the future of the war as his readiness to act to affect it. De Gaulle was always torn in his judgment of Renault and would defend him from detractors. Never in these tragic days did poor Renault cease to be a master of himself. It was a tragic spectacle to see a man of great worth unjustly crushed by excessive events. Everything has been swept away. In such conditions, the intelligence of Monsieur Renault his courage, the authority of his office, acted in a kind of void. One can read the judgment in conjunction with his diagnosis of leadership in his edge of the sword. The intervention of human will in the chain of events has something irrevocably about it. Responsibility presses down with such weight that few men are capable of bearing it alone. That is why the greatest qualities of intelligence do not suffice. Undoubtedly, intelligence helps and instinct pushes one, but in the last resort, a decision has a moral element. De Gaulle, who spent much of the interwar years reflecting on the nature of leadership, had written the script. Now, he was ready to act it out, even if this meant disobeying France's most revered military leader. In The Edge of the Sword, he had also quoted a judgment by the first Lord of the Admiralty on the British Admiral Lord Jellicoe after the Battle of Jutland. He has all the qualities of a Nelson bar one. He does not know how to disobey. This was the moment for which de Gaulle had been living in his mind. For many years, as he wrote in the 1920s, when events become grave, the peril passing a sort of tidal wave pushes men of character into the front rank, or to quote from one of the prisoners of war lectures in 1917, without the Peloponnesian War, Demosthenes would have remained an obscure politician. Without the English invasion, Joan of Arc would have died peaceably at Domremy. Without the revolution, Cano and Napoleon would have finished their existence in lowly rank. Without the present war, General Pétain would have finished his career at the head of a brigade. Without the fall of France, de Gaulle would undoubtedly become a leading general in the French army, probably a minister of defence, possibly even a head of government, but he would never have become de Gaulle. Of course, that is a very romantic view of conceiving of it. De Gaulle, however, you can almost say again, referring back to the central theme of imprudence, all of this allowed some sort of romantic and you can say, uh, megalomaniacal conception of what de Gaulle was essentially doing, but you have to view it in the sense of desperation. And indeed, it was something de Gaulle could conceive of himself as doing as serving his country, opposing what he saw as the 
irredeemable defeatism of the Vichy regime. And then, of course, there is a far more self-serving motive, which is the prospect that de Gaulle was fleeing from France, not attempting to set up an alternative government in exile, simply for the sake of preventing his arrest at the hands of Bitton and others who viewed de Gaulle was essentially obstinate when it came to the issue of any form of association, let alone collaboration when it came to the issue of Germany. So these are all the factors that informed de Gaulle's decision. But nevertheless, it is not simply a matter that he arrives in London and he becomes de Gaulle i.e. de Gaulle at the head of an alternative French government. That is very much the air he attempted to create. But to posit when he delivered his speech on the 18th of June, the speech I read out at the beginning of this presentation, is completely absurd. The British were not prepared to recognise him at the government. Essentially, they viewed the government in France essentially as the legitimate government. They were neutral now. France had formed a separate peace, which had created a very awkward position between Britain and France, given that Britain was still prosecuting the war against Germany. And this had not led, as Hitler had hoped, to an armistice with Britain, something that he had essentially proposed after the armistice at Compiègne. However, the British ambivalence towards Vichy was quickly stymied when Churchill diagnosed that the French still had significant military potential. They still had the colonial empire. And in particular, we have the French fleet in the Mediterranean at Mel's El Kabir. And this led to Churchill's very contentious and controversial decision to bomb the French fleet at Mel's El Kabir, which caused a suspension of diplomatic relations. It even caused the French to retaliate by attempting to attack Gibraltar. And for de Gaulle, de Gaulle, who had disowned himself from uh, the Piton regime and had essentially be seen as a, uh, a lackey of the British at this time, given his uh, situation in London and his desire to fight on and appeal specifically to French on British soil of all ranks, whether it be engineers, whether it be industrialists or whether it be soldiers. This was a PR disaster for him and brought his remarkable, what is remarkable considering his hostility continuous hostility uh, towards Britain for the rest of his life, that of all the facts of the relationship between France and Britain at this time, the attack on Mers al Kabir was not something for which he would later admonish the British. Rather, he understood that there was a fundamental logic in it, that the French fleet could not be allowed to attach itself to the German war effort. Indeed, you can say the um, extension of the war effort, which would expand through Italy, um, the threat of Gibraltar, obviously, uh, but the idea of French power being able to project outwards to threaten Egypt, the jugular vein of the British Empire. Nevertheless, de Gaulle was placed in the impossible situation of begrudgingly um, justifying the attack. And of course, what does this do? This undermines his legitimacy and his authority and basically takes the wind out of the sails of a speech that was given a few days earlier. So what was de Gaulle left with after this? De Gaulle was essentially left with a committee that would include French members who had participated in the Narvik operation. A few months earlier, the Germans had attacked Norway, and the British had led a essentially a counteroffensive to that. Uh, f forgive me, I think it was called Operation Catherine. Uh, again, uh, some of the things I have written down, some of the things I don't. So um, there were French participants in the operation to stymie the German attempt to secure Narvik. Um, of course, this operation ended in disaster, uh, but there were some French uh, who had come over during the uh, Dunkirk evacuation, and there were some French who essentially had acted in um, joint expeditions, operations with the British, who found themselves now in British soil, effectively dispossessed. There were, of course, a number of Spanish Republicans, going back to de Gaulle's earlier point that he had no particular admonition uh, for the horrors committed by the Spanish Republicans, and was in fact willing to collaborate and adopt many Spanish Republicans uh, onto the French side, so long as they were hostile to Germany. There were a token number of disaffected representatives, i.e. representatives of the National Assembly. The National Assembly, when it moved to Vichy, had overwhelmingly voted to suspend the constitution of the Third Republic and give uh, give uh, Piton as the head of the state of France full powers. Um, nevertheless, there were some disaffected representatives who would go over to de Gaulle. Um, you can say that these were true believers um, true believers in the Republican institutions of France. And there were also others who had listened to his original speech on the 18th of June, and they had been inspired to actually flee France, to go over and to join his cause. And 
we're talking about a motley crew. We're talking about committed Republicans, but we're also talking about um, people from aristocratic backgrounds as well, um, who came over to join because they believe that de Gaulle was fighting for French honor. Indeed, in that contrast with how one views life and honor and the defense of the patrie, um, the original contest between Pétain and de Gaulle. How is one saving France in this case? Is one saving France by acting as Joan of Arc, continuing to resist? Or is one saving France by implementing a form of, sh of a shield collaboration, i.e. defending the nation by forming a sense of tacit appeasement with the nation that has effectively conquered you. It's not simply something that's going to face the Vichy regime and Pétain, uh, but it's also something that many other regimes in Europe would have to contest with as the Germans continue to expand their empire across all of Europe. However, many of this motley crew were suspicious of de Gaulle's motives and his aspirations for personal power. However, they also refused to believe that Pétain was anything but apolitical, that Pétain, as referenced with this idea of a shield collaboration, had been called to serve France, to save France at its absolute nadir. In essence, it is impossible to divine a prevailing ideology for this original group of mavericks, and de Gaulle has suggested to one of his subordinates that it may be necessary to create an ideology. One French admiral, for example, who defected to de Gaulle, went on to horrify the British when he threatened to shoot any French sailor who dared to enlist in the Royal Navy. You can say in many ways that this represented some sort of spiritual counterpart um, to de Gaulle in terms of being able to resist the encroachments of British attempts to assimilate the power of the remnants of the Free French into the British army. And de Gaulle's attempt at also carving out an independent path, but only shows to uh, demonstrate the, uh, the strange personalities that now surrounded themselves around de Gaulle. And how did the British simply respond to this? Well, he's the only French admiral we have. So for now, the task had effectively to fall onto the British to establish a mythos for de Gaulle, now that he had towed the British line when it came to the attack on the French fleet at Mers al Kabir. At de Gaulle's first speaking engagement, he didn't say a word, and for this, the press dubbed him the silent general. Though de Gaulle had remained silent out of extreme modesty for his rudimentary level of English, he later turned this into one of these sort of um, aspects, the legend of de Gaulle. De Gaulle, when he would visit so many foreign countries across Latin America, across Africa, across Asia, and of course in North America, he would always make a valiant attempt to deliver his speeches in the language of his host nation, except when it came to English-speaking nations. <laughs> uh, one particular aspect of anti-English uh, anti Gaullist pride, but you can say it has its humble origins, this policy, uh, with the inception of the silent general who could not speak English. Later, it becomes the bombastic, impudent de Gaulle who will refuse to speak English. So from such modest beginnings, de Gaulle's free French force attempted to subvert the legitimacy of the Bitton government in the colonies. Good instruction to bring up this map. The colonies whose independence had been guaranteed by the armistice at Compiègne, the armistice with Germany. The fate of the colonies depended in part upon the disposition of the local governors. The first to proactively go over to de Gaulle were the New Hebride Islands over east of Australia. So it should be mentioned that Vichy went out of its way to replace many of the governors who they considered to have wavering loyalties. And there is a reason why the New Hebrides Islands went over to France first because they were already effectively a condominium uh, between France and Britain. They were a joint venture, as uh, so the idea of the New Hebrides becoming hostile to Britain was quite frankly preposterous and France had no ability to simply object. But nevertheless, from this very modest beginning, there is a joint French-British operation from Lagos in Nigeria, which was then a British colony, and Leopoldville in the Belgian Congo, which saw Chad, Congo, Cameroon, the Red here, the equatorial Africa, declare for de Gaulle, followed by smaller French positions in Tahiti and India. You can see these with the red specks indicated on this map. Though this early success was soon checked by the failure to gain control of Dakar in Senegal, the key to French West Africa, 
Until now, de Gaulle could have saved some face that he wasn't instigating a civil war in France, though the fact that no shots had been fired up until this point. The battle for Dakar shattered this illusion. Despite this major setback, de Gaulle was able to establish an alternative French capital at Brazzaville in the French Congo, affording him some distance both physical and political from the British government. There, the two-star General de Gaulle was able to induce one five-star General, Catreau, to his cause, a boon to the cause of the Free French and to de Gaulle's tentative authority as the leader of the French government. Were they gone, who was now Vichy's commander in North Africa, to have defected to the Free French, it is certain that the British would have coaxed de Gaulle into relinquishing his authority as provisional head of state, as Vigand would never submit to de Gaulle. From Brazzaville, de Gaulle promulgated a manifesto, whereby, as France had no proper government for Vichy, Vichy was an unconstitutional settlement subject to the control of the enemy. De Gaulle had a sacred duty at the head of the new Empire Defence Council to direct the French war effort against the Axis powers. De Gaulle then invaded Gabon, the last major French colony in equatorial Africa. Though he downplayed the invasion to that of a police operation, nevertheless, Frenchmen had again fought Frenchmen. This was fratricidal conflict, and it would only continue. Now de Gaulle fashioned a symbol for his government, the Cross of Lorraine, an explicit reference to the restoration of France under Joan of Arc. The British reacted coldly to the Brazzaville Manifesto, refusing to broadcast it and to recognise the authority which de Gaulle was claiming for himself. The British viewed de Gaulle as but a single factor in the undermining of Vichy, not an undisputed French potentate. In terms of trying to find inspirations other than history, there is a contemporary, his there is a contemporary example uh, which many people in the audience may in fact be able to um, surmise right now, which is Franco. During the original military coup against the Spanish uh, Republic in 1936, uh, the original um, head of government, or head of state was always um, contended, but head of government uh, was afforded to one General San Jorge, uh, who died in a plane accident a day after the uh, failed putsch. So the question of military authority was essentially handed over to a junta, and it was ambiguous as to who would lead that junta, because Franco, Francisco Franco, uh, was a very low-ranking general within the echelons of those who had defected. And many of the generals of various political stripes, Franco, uh, wanted a head of state who was essentially either the restoration of King Alfonso or a Carlos candidate or some form of joint command. What Franco does in one of his early press speeches is declare to himself as French as a, the Spanish head of state. He had incredibly sort of contested authority. Um, the government had provisionally given him, or rather the junta had provisionally given him the authority as head of government. And changing the word to head of state, Franco had fundamentally altered the political composition of the Spanish state for the next 40 years. And it would seem, I, I can't help but feel that de Gaulle, in addition to viewing this in uh, impudent and megalomaniacal terms about him restoring France and him embodying France, that I think he would look to Franco and see this as an obvious example. When you have a contested authority, when you have a state in civil war, when the legitimate government you have basically discredited, it simply comes to one man to declare that he is Spain, or in the case of de Gaulle, he is France. De Gaulle was consistent on the theme that the interests of France were not the interests of Britain, that it was simply not a matter of defeating the Axis, but that France must be victorious against the Axis. The divergence of French and British interests became apparent over the issue of Syria and Lebanon. A pro-Axis coup had taken place in Iraq, and Delon, the Prime Minister of Vichy France, had allowed the Germans use of Vichy airfields in Syria. Given the major strategic implications of a second front opening against Egypt, this provided an opportunity for de Gaulle to assert his sovereignty over these French mandates, the French mandates, of course, of which he had been appointed as a military commander some decades before. Nevertheless, the British ousted the Vichy administration in Syria with the support of local Arabs in a direct threat to the continuation of the French colonial empire. 
There then came the issue of Vichy POWs, whether to be repatriated to France, Vichy France, or to be recruited into the Free French by de Gaulle. De Gaulle made no secret of his belief that the awkward neutrality of Vichy and British interests while undermining the overall war effort. Essentially, uh, the neutrality of Vichy allowed Britain to pursue a policy of divide and conquer when it came to the lingering aspects of France's colonial empire. To these public accusations made against the British when de Gaulle's war was funded by London, caused many in the British government to characterise de Gaulle as frankly insane. Nevertheless, the insane de Gaulle was able to weather the myriad opposition to his highly contested possession at the headship of France. Perhaps the greatest threat during the war came from one Admiral Dallon, the same Admiral at the head of the Vichy regime, just under Pétain. Dallon's defection to the Allies guaranteed the success of Operation Torch, the operation, as you can see here in the pale blue, that saw North Africa defect. And had Dallan survived, de Gaulle's power may have depended on his personal relationship and patronage with, de Gaulle, with uh, Eisenhower and Churchill over the opportunist Dallan, who had nevertheless dealt Vichy a near fatal blow. Following this, the Germans occupy the rest of Vichy France, and for all intents and purposes, neutrality in Vichy is gone, and Vichy has become a satellite state, not simply a neutral state. What saves de Gaulle? Dalan's convenient death not soon after. This prevented the erection of a rival castle to his authority. The only serious contender to de Gaulle from within now came from one General Giraud, whom de Gaulle successfully outmaneuvered. It should also be noted that de Gaulle, throughout the period of the Free French Resistance, he was appealing to the resistance on the one hand, but who actually led the Free French forces in part was one General Leclerc. Um, de Gaulle was effectively a political leader, he was not a military leader during this time. He was providing an overarching strategy for the French forces. But Leclerc was, say, for example, the general who uh, led the first operations in the Libyan desert against the Italians and would go on to uh, fight for France in North Africa and um, indeed in the liberation of France. Nevertheless, de Gaulle still had to come had to contend with the hostility of the FDR. Uh, what happened to Delar? Um, I believe he was assassinated. Uh, de Gaulle still had to contend with the hostility of FDR, whom considered de Gaulle a potential dictator. FDR's perception of de Gaulle's illegitimacy caused him to argue that France ought to be administered by AMGOT, i.e. the military administration of the British and the Americans, and that a French government must be instituted after the war, not during the war, as a provisional government under de Gaulle. However, FDR was faced with overwhelming opposition from his own cabinet, and ultimately FDR capitulated. Against seemingly insurmountable odds, de Gaulle arrived in Paris in 1944, following the success of Operation Overlord, at the head of a real government of the Metropole France, and with the status of a legend. Here, I am reading from an article called A Certain Idea of France, written by Lawrence Kurtz Kritzman. As with all of the articles and major citations in these presentations, uh, you can find these linked in the description. On the eve of the referendum in April of 1969, uh, yes, this is in fact live, hence how I'm being able to respond to your questions. <laughs> On the eve of the referendum in April 1969, that would permanently put an end to his political career. Charles de Gaulle confided to one Jean de Lipkowski, the Secretary of State, it's true the French don't want de Gaulle anymore, but the myth you see, the myth will grow 30 years from now. The general's procrastination was indeed true, for in the years that ensued between the end of his presidency and the dawn of the 21st century, many of those who might have been opposed to de Gaulle in 1968 suddenly saw him in a new light. To refer to de Gaulle as a myth-maker would constitute more than the simple art of litot. Exiled in London in June of 1940, de Gaulle became the voice and spirit of free France to such an extent that often it was impossible to distinguish between the general's desire and the exigencies of the national will. Advancing a mythical aura that he partook of as both a duty and sign of providence, de Gaulle's adventure intertwined the story of his personal quest with the history of France. <laughs> 
As Jean Lacoutre has suggested in his monumental biography, the myth associated with de Gaulle was indeed the cause and the results of his achievements. Lacoutre reconsecrates the general as a mythical tour, one who consciously constructs a self-image that is meant to reflect a mythical aura. To be sure, this myth-making process must be seen as more than the simple expression of an overblown ego. De Gaulle referred to as the last Frenchman, enabled France to survive the war and subsequently impart to it institutional structures that gave it stability. Like Jean d'Arc like during the Hundred Years' War and Napoleon in his numerous military campaigns, de Gaulle inscribed himself in the pantheon of heroic figures who engaged in the defence of France. As a mythical tour, de Gaulle invented a certain idea of France, a concept of the nation associated with him and predicated on the belief in France itself. The Gaullist idea of France set out to restore the honour of the nation and affirm its grandeur and independence. For 3,000 years, there had been a covenant between the greatness of France and the freedom of the world. De Gaulle took it upon himself to construct a messianic view of France's historic destiny in order to reaffirm its prestige in the world and transcend the national humiliation to which Vichy had submitted itself. None of this could be realized, however, without de Gaulle's charisma, his power of communication, and his desire to situate himself above the constraints of all political parties that contributed to his success. Focusing on charisma, I juxtapose this earlier with his austere um, and taciturn form of military command. It is very difficult to see de Gaulle the general compared to, say, for example, de Gaulle the politician, given the fact that de Gaulle was seldom essentially allowed to operate as a general apart from those few weeks during the battle for France. And nevertheless, I think given the way that he essentially treated his subordinates during the conflict and the fact that he would go off alone, um, often without uh, any form of sort of orders or consultation, believing his subordinates to be able to carry out his orders for him, uh, he wasn't exactly like a general pattern. Um, <laughs> but very much I consider him a charismatic personality uh, through, the ven through the vein of a politician, which is ironic given the fact that de Gaulle was a general and would always be known as General de Gaulle. De Gaulle's major success as a strategist was achieved far more on a discursive level than on the battlefield, since action employs men's fervour, but words would arouse it. As Régis Debray has suggested, de Gaulle was a legend, a term to be understood in its etymological meaning as something to be read and of course, literally in terms of his speech. For the general, both oral and written language constituted a form of action, whereby the logos became a praxis, word and action, articulated in the name of France and meant to arouse a psychological response. In the name of the people I, General de Gaulle, leader of the French, Free French, do proclaim. Words acquire the power of actions as well as of the will. They represent actions because they function in ways that, are lit that literally are actions. In a sense, fighting the war became a question of rhetorical efficacy, for de Gaulle believed that a fight to restore freedom to France was a battle against those who would stop us from speaking French. Using language as a military tactic, de Gaulle embodied a set of nationalistic principles that could only be carried by an extraordinary individual when confronted with the contingencies of history. A great man is born from the encounter between great character and great luck, yet greatness, as the general conceived of it, can only be realised by engaging heroically in the rendezvous of destiny. One can achieve greatness even if one lacks great means, but one must measure up to history, for without, one, for the, without that, one disappears. De Gaulle was first and foremost a writer of great skill. The drama that de Gaulle envisioned could not have been brought to fruition without his ability to mobilize the imagination through the epic qualities of his rhetorical maneuvers. De Gaulle, who referred to himself as a poet of action, un poet de l'action, engaged in what Roland Barthes characterized as the parody of heroic literature. The general amplified his defensive strategy in a language that took on epic proportions and had metaphysical implications. As I saw it, the stake of the conflict was not only the fate of nations and states, but the human condition as well. Under the growing impact of the struggle for freedom, this emphatic mode of positioning of um, positing suggests that the outcome of the war will be played out as thoughts empire over thought, or perhaps more precisely, the battle of the survival of an idea. <laughs>
Perhaps the greatest idea at stake for de Gaulle was what he called a certain idea of France. The overture to the first volume of his war memoirs is quite revelatory, since it contains all of the key topi, uh, topoi that constitute the Gaullist idiolect, reason, affection, and most of all, grandeur. These themes become the grammar and syntax governing signification in Gaullist discourse. Along with the self presentation affirming the centrality of France and his childhood formation, de Gaulle foregrounds his commitment to France as part of his spiritual heritage. His belief in France, somewhat congruous to one's belief in God, became an imperative that was sustained by faith and certainty. The fate of the victors was based on absolute knowledge and had overdetermined discourse that, paradoxically, produced a new beginning by liquidating the possibility of an infelicitous end. Interestingly, by referring to his vision as France of a, as a certain idea, de Gaulle leaves no room for doubt concerning free France's survival. Accordingly, he formulated discursive constraints on how France should be defined by conceiving it as a matter of vision and limit. To my mind, France cannot be France without grandeur. This restrictive clause in its generality of expression presents France as the subject of an extraordinary history that excribes itself as an absolute reality without having the possibility of an alternative outcome. The positive side of my mind also assures me that France is not really herself unless it is in the front rank. For France to really be itself, for it to exist authentically as a realization of an idea, it must embody a thought with which an in the course of being, thought becomes a form of praxis. For 20 centuries are there to attest that one is always right to believe in France. De Gaulle's conception of France of an idea renders it in the abstraction to experience the state of mind, referring back again, the, specific, the specificity of the France of the 2000 years versus the France of 1,500 years. Here in the language of the resistance, France is, and um, de Gaulle, <laughs> synonymous with France, it would seem, uh, is definitely relying on the example of Vercingetorix and the uh, war of liberation of the Gauls against uh, Julius Caesar. But this also points into another mind. One talks about his ambivalence towards national socialism. He wasn't a committed anti-Nazi, and that never really comes across in any of his writings throughout the rest of his life. But the idea of France must exist with greatness, with grandeur that France must be a nation of the front rank, that this is an absolute reality. Hitler said the same thing. Hitler said that Germany must be a world power or it must cease to exist. Hitler believed in nationally deterministic struggles between nations, the most fundamental struggle for him being the struggle between the German peoples and the Slavic peoples that would be defined in the Great, great Patriotic War. So, shorn of the more particular aspects and racialism of national socialist ideology, one can actually say the Gaulle, in this conception of his French grandeur, fighting in opposition to the Axis, has indebted many ideas which are also inherent in national socialism. And of course, de Gaulle would revile at that. But again, you can probably pander to the idea of both Germany and France existing in the minds of their leaders as some form of supreme reality. That also in the sense that both Hitler and de Gaulle believed that they were in some ways representations of the nation. Hitler possessed Germany and de Gaulle possessed France. So I don't think it's really that much of a stretch to compare the two within this particular concept, um, focusing on abstractions and uh, generalities without diving into specifics. Indeed, Hitler is obviously focusing on a far more doctrinaire and ideological conception of Germany than de Gaulle ever did. De Gaulle's passion for France projects on this image certain anthropomorphic qualities. In most cases, France is represented as a woman depicted either as a maternal figure, a goddess, or as a certain eternal feminine, signifying sovereignty and unrequited love. When de Gaulle makes reference to his emotional side, the effect related to the idea of France is embodied in a female figure as associated with desire, evoking the princess in the fairy stories or the Madonna in the frescoes, at once appealing to France's Catholic legacy, as we have already seen. But also you can say, um, uh, focusing on the fact that France in many ways was the originator of the fairy story um, with the works of certain French literary figures in the 17th century. If de Gaulle suggests a rapport that is both intimate and abstract, 
it is because he describes his lifelong love affair with an idea as a passion motivated by the seductive power of a myth and the truth with which it embodies. With the defeat of France in 1940 and the signing of an armistice with Nazi Germany by the Vichy government, de Gaulle took it upon himself to engage in an act of rebellion that sought to rally France to resist. As the self-chosen leader of the French movement, emphasis on self-chosen here, and going back to what I'm emphasizing, the fact that de Gaulle represents impudence, but impudence is essentially the essence of de Gaulle, which is also France and grandeur, the pursuit of grandeur. De Gaulle became intransigent in his desire to incarnate the indomitable spirit of free France. He rebelled against Maréchal Pétain, the incarnation of the father figure par excellence, whom he depicted as being as good as dead. At stake was the refusal to collaborate with Germany, a step that de Gaulle equated with the undermining of the republican values of the nation state that was the true France. Honour would not be sacrificed to expediency, and the ideals of true France remain eternal. I would push back against the association between Republican values. I don't believe that comes across in de Gaulle at all, um, as we will actually see in terms of his attempt to reconcile aspects of Vichyism, save for the principal aspect which informs all of Gaulle's thinking. I do not believe for de Gaulle there was really any ideological contest between Vichy and Free France, which may seem remarkable. The contest was essentially between victory and defeatism. For de Gaulle, it may take forever, it may take collaboration with foreign powers, but France must be victorious, and France will emerge as a great power. It will not be a supplicant to Germany, and it will miraculously avoid becoming a supplicant to Great Britain. But here we have the return and the fate of this... Um, uh, relationship where the son has spurned the father and now the son has eclipsed the father because de Gaulle comes and he forms a provisional government as stated which in itself was a miracle it should also be noted in terms of creating the literary figure of de Gaulle and de Gaulle on the radio that many French tuned in to de Gaulle's speeches during the war um, of course uh, it was essentially um, uh, prohibited to listen to de Gaulle. Nevertheless, many French did. So among the resistance, among the free French forces, there was already the myth of de Gaulle, which had been established within the minds of France as the D-Day operations happened. And a few months later, we see the liberation of Paris. So it is not simply the foistering of this uh, effectively of this nobody, which de Gaulle had been in 1940. The myth of de Gaulle has carried through into the population of France, which had been under German occupation and under the regime in Vichy. And that allows it to translate into authority for de Gaulle, gravitas for de Gaulle. And you can say the wiser heads, in this case, it will be Churchill and um, even FDR's Secretary of War, who tells FDR, that it will be utterly disastrous for the continuation, indeed the morale of the combatants in the war to administer France as a um, occupied country under the Americans and the British. But again, you can say that this is almost some fidelity from FDR um, in terms of democratic politics that, you know, who is de Gaulle? What is his mandate? He is a dictator. In some respects, he is. And this comes to the stabilization. So Pétain, is the target par excellence of the legal purges. In terms of how de Gaulle viewed Bitton now, he referred to him as successive, uh, successively banal, then glorious, then deplorable. However, in terms of being able to look back on the, what he would say essentially the, uh, the legal overreach when dealing with the members of the Vichy government, de Gaulle would say too often, the discussions took on the appearance of a partisan trial, sometimes even a settling of accounts, when the whole affair should have been treated only from the standpoint of national defense and independence. Again, in terms of drawing a parallel between the Spanish Civil War, after the Republicans had been defeated, and indeed this was a constant feature throughout the war because many towns changed sides, um, especially in the northeast of Spain, 
a factor that was common it wasn't simply an ideological conflict it was a matter of settling personal scores between personalities um vendettas family feuds uh banditry all of these sort of examples obviously that latter wouldn't necessarily be the case in terms of the uh, legal purges um of the french monarch of the uh, the french government under de gaulle nevertheless he deplored the fact because in terms of an ancient monarchical conception of what it means to be at the head of France, of which de Gaulle was, um, the King of France, um, Louis the Ninth, Saint Louis, uh, is the originator of justice. Uh, France doesn't have this, I, I would say, aberration, which is, say, for example, the American uh, strict delineation between the separation of powers. Um, the head of state is also supposed to be the supreme uh, arbiter of justice. And you can say that this stains de Gaulle's honor, the fact that the authorities were so officious in terms of going after political enemies, which it should be noted had been part of the legal constitutionally uh, constituted government of France as of 1940. And so this does appear to be, you can say, a process of delegitimating Vichy. It is not enough simply to overtake Vichy. One must destroy the legacy of Vichy by putting on trial all of its members, even the aged and senile Pitain in particular, uh, which was cause for major controversy within France and indeed without France. And indeed, it's something I wish I'd been able to uh, speak more on in terms of the intricacies when I did my uh, my little video on uh, Vichy France as some sort of prelude to this. In fact, the treatment and imprisonment of Pitain, uh, who was entering into his 90s, was so controversial that even Truman, the president of the United States after the death of FDR, offered, along with Franco, it should be pointed out, uh, to give uh, Marshal Pitain amnesty, but he never was. However, you can say the most obvious case in terms of the um, crackdown, and this really does seem to be a military crackdown against the uh, the Vichy members who are now Vichy collaborators uh, was the example of uh, Pierre Laval, a prominent figure and prime minister during the Third Republic, uh, who had become the essentially the prominent figure within the Vichy regime after the death of Dalon, um, and he was sentenced to death. It should be noted of the roughly 2,000 members of Vichy who were sentenced to death, and again, you can say the heavy-handed response to the French government, again, is a common feature of de Gaulle throughout the uh, 1950s and 60s as well. Um, he commuted around half of these uh, sentences, uh, having that power, of course, as uh, the, essentially the self-designated head of state. Uh, but nevertheless, his mercy did not extend uh, to Pierre Laval, someone who would definitely be considered as one of the French right or even... Um, one of the non-conformists allying to Marshal Bitton. Such was the case of the son eclipsing the father and the ideology of the resistance being allowed to completely overtake and eviscerate the legacy of Vichy collaboration. France is the victorious power eclipsing uh, Vichy collaboration. Uh, there is a political impetus, but there is also a, um, in terms of looking at this as almost like a theology of France, there is a theological impetus uh, to condemn uh, Vichyism. And I, I don't use these terms lightly. You can say Vichyism with the legal purges has become a form of heresy in France as an ideology. But nevertheless, this period is where we really see de Gaulle grappling desperately in his pursuit of grandeur, to hold on to France's position as a great power. He has been able to present the world with a fait accompli, which is his position as the head of state of France against the seemingly insurmountable odds. And it comes to various snubs, snubs that he will bear with him for the rest of life. One prominent one is at the uh, conference at Casablanca, um, one of the early uh, conferences dealing with the post-war situation. Uh, Despite the fact that Casablanca, after Operation Torch, uh, was part of de Gaulle's realm, it was part of French Morocco, which was then considered part of the French colonial empire, uh, de Gaulle was not allowed to attend uh, the conference between um, uh, Roosevelt and Churchill, uh, which he took uh, not only as a personal snub, but as a snub against France on French territory, two powers essentially being able to dictate the course of peace while ignoring the host nation. This uh, aspect, you can say, of the uh, uh, denigration of French grandeur is repeated at Yalta and at Potsdam, of which de Gaulle was not allowed to participate. But the crisis that really defines Gaulle's antipathy, I would say, to Atlanticism 
to Britain and America beyond, you can say, a sense of uh, wily pragmatism is the British betrayal over the Levant crisis. I brought up earlier that the British had, quote unquote, betrayed France when they had allied with local Syrian and Arab nationalists um, in order to subvert Dalon um, in Syria to avoid giving material support and uh, uh, airfields to the Axis powers to basically hold on to the uh, pro-Axis coup in Iraq. In just one month after VE Day in 1945, um, there was an uprising in Syria. And the British, once again, as they had in 1941, the British invaded. And this time, Churchill gave explicit orders. orders. If the French resist, fire. And this was to support the independence of Syria, essentially something that Britain had committed itself to in 1941. And after this, Lebanon and Syria became independent and the mandate was dissolved. This actually, surely under other circumstances, could have acted like Fashoda um, in 19, 1898 over the issue of Sudan as a potential casus belli between Britain and France only a month after having defeated Germany in World War II. And um, this particular snub is something that would never be forgiven by de Gaulle. And again, you can say it's the legacy of de Gaulle having essentially led a colonial war, a colonial civil war within the empire against France, that now he has to address the fact that the colonial empire is weaker than it's ever been. As you can see on this map, uh, there is something which isn't gray or blue or red, it's yellow, it's uh, French Indochina. French Indochina remained part of the French colonial empire technically, but it was occupied by the Japanese. And this became a major staging post and resource area for the Japanese war effort. But the occupation had essentially led to Ho Chi Minh's insurrection and the advance of the communists in North Vietnam and what essentially led to a 10 year war between France and the communists, the, the Viet Minh. Uh, this was de Gaulle's inheritance and this would essentially bleed over into Algeria. So as we see with Syria and as we see with Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam, de Gaulle, yes, he is victorious in one sense. He has been able to restore the territory of the metropole, but the colonial empire is unraveling around him. What he is able to achieve, however, which are major victories uh, in terms of French prestige and diplomacy, the Tsarland is once again detached from what would later become West Germany to become a French protectorate, uh, a major coal area. France would also get its own zones of occupation in the Palatinate and in Swabia. However, Stalin was sort of very um, uh, <laughs> um, dismissive of this idea, saying if there is going to be a French zone of occupation in Germany, it'll have to come out of the British and the uh, American zones. And this is why the French zone was, along with the zone in Austria. Uh, was comparatively smaller. Yet if there was going to be any signification that France had reobtained a semblance of great power status, it was that, along with being able to um, become a part member of the uh, Security Council. But then again, you have to consider it didn't really mean much, um, as much as it would essentially give the impression today, because China, the Republic of China, uh, which had spent most of the war being occupied by the Japanese, was also given a seat on the Security Council as a victorious major power. So this is the context in which we see the effects of decolonization and the new threats that France would face. And in fact, the threat that would propel de Gaulle back into a position of power. And why Gaulle left power is that as democracy was allowed to arrive, as de Gaulle's potentate, um, as de Gaulle is potentate, after de Gaulle's um, personal rule came to an end, a new constitution was formulated. And the new constitution basically restored uh, the status quo antebellum. They restored the institutions of the Third Republic, i.e. a weak presidency and a revolving series of ministers, essentially a revolving door around a very weak parliamentary um, system with a weak party system, uh, which led to, in many cases, it was remarkable if the government lasted an entire year. That was the system that was recreated. And already de Gaulle, laboring after this point that he himself was inseparable to the idea of France, would only countenance the idea of a monarchical France. 
And so it is this despairing that leads essentially to his period in the wilderness after having uh, left the provisional government of France as head of state from 1946 up until he returns to power in 1958. And after that, a rather long speech on my part, uh, I'm going to come back to Jackson in terms of providing the political context of the uh, instability of the Fourth Republic given that as a backdrop in terms of de Gaulle in government as a provisional head of state. On the 5th of February 1947, de Gaulle gathered some close followers, Paleski, Guy, Soustel, Debray, for a secret meeting at his brother-in-law's flat in the Avenue Mozart in Paris. It was his first visit to the capital for five months, and he was in high spirits, not only because he escaped the monotonous inactivity at Colombay, Columbay being his country estate, effectively his uh, dacha, if I'm going to use Russian, uh, but because he had a plan. For a quarter of an hour, he outlined what he had in mind. Since the constitution that the French people had unenthusiastic chosen, um, unenthusiastically chosen would lead to decadence, inflation, and the end of the French empire, he would create a movement of his own to defend his constitutional ideas. His listeners were mostly unenthusiastic. Most of those present worried that by descending into the political arena, de Gaulle would tarnish the legendary aura of the 18th of June. De Gaulle was not put off. In his current mood, he was ready to accept the comparison with the 18th of June. The country is accepting the occupation by the parties with the same apathy as it accepted the German occupation. It is the same thing, which is a rather remarkable thing for him to say in terms of his evolving conception of defeatism. No one was more sceptical than his own wife. When de Gaulle mused about a new 18th of June, she proffered a rare political opinion. Nobody will follow you. De Gaulle's reply was, shut up, Yvonne. I am old enough to know what I want to do. He would have done well to listen at that time. De Gaulle launched his movement in a number of carefully calibrated public interventions over the next two months. At the first, on the 30th of March, he appeared at a ceremony in the village of Bruneval in Normandy to commemorate the Allied commando raid during the war. This was ostensibly a non-political ceremony, but de Gaulle's speech hinted at a day when the immense mass of the French people will gather around the name of France, that is to say, de Gaulle. On the 7th of April, at a huge meeting at Strasbourg, de Gaulle announced that he was forming a new rassemblement gathering to save the country from catastrophe. Claude Mariac, although sceptical about the idea, was carried away despite himself. Never shall I forget this huge crowd, drunk with enthusiasm, each time the general was called back to the balcony. Finally, on the 24th of April, de Gaulle, attired reassuringly in a suit rather than the uniform, gave his press conference, a first press conference since October 1945, he batted away suggestions that he was aiming at a dictatorship. The gathering of the French people was launched, RPF. The government was rattled. Rumours of de Gaulle's intentions had started to leak even before he spoke at Bruneval. On the same day, Prime Minister Ramadier delivered a speech warning against the temptation of boulangism, going back to my earlier reference when it comes to General Boulanger in the 1880s and 90s. He was sufficiently alarmed to make the long drive to Colombe on the 2nd of April, announcing himself to a startled de Gaulle late in the night. The purpose of the visit was to warn him that unless he desisted from political interventions, the government could no longer accord him official honours during public appearances. De Gaulle refused to provide any such assurances. Having given Ramadier a glass of cognac, he sent him on his way sarcastically, offering him of, with a week, sorry, sent him away sarcastically, offering him all my complaint, compliments for your government. Once the RPF had been formally launched, de Gaulle was banned from the airwaves. Essentially, the myth had been created. The myth was useful for the ensuing legitimacy of the Fourth Republic. Indeed, the same logic applied to the legal purges. But they wanted de Gaulle to be a decoration. They wanted someone to stand around, be the father of the nation, quote unquote, and hand out medals. They couldn't deal with a political threat from de Gaulle and attempted to repress him for such um, obstinacy in terms of his desire to come back and uh, save the nation repeatedly. RPF was a new departure for de Gaulle. In 1943, he'd adopted Moulin's policy of rehabilitating political parties over Brosselet's vision of a new political force uniting around Gaullism, 
1944, he rejected the idea of lending his name to a new resistance party. In 1945, when Plevin, Debray and Schumann, Schumann being one of the quote-unquote founding fathers of the European Union, albeit, again, my disdain for that phrase, and others have sought his advice about their political future. He recommended they join one of the existing parties. De Gaulle was banking on his charisma to oblige all the parties to swallow their differences and accept his particular leadership. His model was something like the sacred union of the Great War, or the free French when politicians had agreed to subsume their political differences in the higher cause of saving France. Emphasis on saving France again. These had, of course, both been exceptional war situations, but for de Gaulle, saving France was a never-ending struggle. He also had a visceral distaste for being associated with a faction. In the autumn of 1946, when hesitating over what to do next, de Gaulle had resisted the temptation to form his own political movement. Claude Guy, who had been witness to a tetchy exchange on the subject of Colombie, one afternoon over tea between de Gaulle, his wife and their son, when Philippe de Gaulle launched into a vehement plea that his father should create his own political party, Madame de Gaulle was provoked to look upon up from her letter writing and interrupt him with a rare political opinion. Why get mixed up in all that? Perhaps events will force them, the politicians, to give in to events. They will seem to surrender to you because opinions has forced them to you. Will bring things back to order. With a pov ami, they will betray you at the first opportunity. As for forming your own party, it will, they will betray you in 15 days. De Gaulle rounded on both his wife and son. You are talking like a child, Yvonne. Both of you make me laugh with your advice. Neither of you understands anything. He prophesied to Guy a month before this conversation. Sooner or later, an organization of that kind will become a political party. You cannot gather a majority just by talking of the empire or the positions of France in the world. Sooner or later, there are interests to satisfy. Although de Gaulle changed his mind because everything else had failed, he still hoped initially that the RPF would remain above party. His members were not required to leave whatever party they belonged to, but the other political parties squashed any idea of dual membership. The communists and socialists were obviously never going to allow it, and the MRP quickly moved for bitters as well. Two prominent MRP members, Edmond Michelet and Louis Tenoir, both of whom had been in the resistance, were expelled from their party when they chose to join the RPF. Despite refusing to call it a party, the RPF quickly started behaving like one. At the end of May, de Gaulle announced that it would be his presenting candidates to the municipal elections in autumn. He embarked on a speaking tour. All his speeches were variations on the same theme of catastrophe. Without new institutions, he predicted that the young Fourth Republic would lead France to economic ruin, jeopardize her national security by allowing the re-emergence of a powerful Germany, and compromise her international standing by abandoning the empire. Defense of the empire was one of de Gaulle's key themes. What gave the imperial argument new urgency was the beginning of the Cold War, which transformed the conflict in Indochina into a battleground for the international struggle against communism. When de Gaulle initially conceived of the RPF, the communists were hardly seen by him as more threatening than the parties in general. This quickly changed as the Cold War started to impact on domestic French politics. In May of 1947, just after de Gaulle launched the RPF, the communists, who refused to back the Ramadier government's economic policy, were summarily sacked. The Communist Party now entered into increasingly strident opposition, just as the wartime unity between the Allies was now degenerating into open conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. So in France, the unity of the resistance embodied in the uneasy tripartite coalition of the communists, the socialists, and the MRP was, def was uh, definitively over. In his speech at Rouen on the 27th of July, de Gaulle launched a violent diatribe against the communists, whom he dubbed as separatists, implying that they no longer formed any national community. He warned menacingly that Russians, Russia's western border was only distant by a two lap, uh, only was only distant by two laps of the Tour de France. Anti-communism became one of the most important themes of the RPF. So, having allied with the communists in order to defeat the Petonists, he is now rallying against the communists, referring to them essentially as fifth columnists acting for the interests of the Soviet Union, which is fair. <laughs> 
until about uh, 1968 when the uh, hopes of the Communist Party in France begin to crater. But again, the emphasis on not forming a political party, something he had not created when he was the head of the French resistance and the head of the provisional government. In many senses, you can say that this, again, is reference to an old monarchical conception. If he is France, then he is above faction. He is representative of all of France. And so his admonition against the communists is not, again, necessarily ideological, but born now to the realization that they will be serving the interests of another nation. Again, there is a basic tolerance here that other parties can form part of his uh, the rubric of his rally of the French people. They have to sublimate themselves to a greater idea of France, but it is the betrayal of France itself and not adhesion to a single ideology, which is the constant theme in de Gaulle's thought. However, that's not necessarily fair in terms of saying that this was a movement without ideology. Instead, something that actually really caught my eye was going back to the earlier references in this presentation about his Catholicism and his fusion of various, you can say, managerial philosophies and elitist theories uh, going back to the 1930s. Indeed, um, I, I can't help but feel that uh, this is all too reminiscent of the Italian uh, elite theorists in the uh, around the same period, um, uh, Pareto and Mosca. Um, indeed, I don't believe they represent some sort of uh, aberration. I do re believe that iterations of these ideas were very much in vogue throughout all the 1930s, uh, from Portugal to Latvia. But on the reference in terms of a specific ideology for the rally and of the implementation of Catholicism in particular. And the focus here is on the idea of association. We don't have political party, we don't have factions, but we have association. We have means of organizing the rally, organizing the gathering of the French people. And this is what is, me what is meant here by association in the Gaullist sense. How de Gaulle alighted upon association as his answer to a, of modern civilization is less clear. One influence was surely social Catholicism, the search for social harmony, that elusive ideal referred to in de Gaulle's 1937 letter, had started to preoccupy the Catholic Church in the late 19th century as socialist parties began to organize the new industrial working class. To meet this challenge, Pope Leo XIII had, in 1891, issued his encyclical Rerum Novarum, which enjoined industrialists to show social responsibility to their workers. Rerum Novarum was the foundational text of social Catholicism, a strand of Catholicism influential among the industrial bourgeoisie of northern France, the milieu of de Gaulle's maternal grandparents. Social Catholics also drew inspiration from de Gaulle's social theorist, Frédéric Leplat, who preached the social responsibility of industrialists and engineers. That idea was taken up in different forms by the French colonial soldier, Marshal Letoy, whose famous 1891 article on the social role of the officer inspired generations of French army officers. Social Catholic thinking drew upon the idea of corporatism, bringing together workers and employees into, a single, into single corporations where their interests would be reconciled. Corporatism was taken up by interwar fascist movements, although once in power, they used ideology to justify the suppression of trade unions. Um, again, that's not particularly fair. Yes, in terms of fascism, there were elements of corporatism that were subsumed. Uh, in Italy, this is more complicated. In national socialism isn't synonymous with fascism. And corporatism, you can say, was the bedrock of uh, Salazar's Estado Novo in Portugal. And I believe that the experiment with corporatism the Portuguese variation of participatory politics was so successful that unlike um, what we see in Franco in Spain, uh, Estado Novo was able to survive uh, Salazar's uh, incapacitation and death. The doctrine also influenced some members of the Vichy regime, as did social Catholicism. It is interesting in this context to note that in his memoirs, which he started writing at this time, de Gaulle was to pay a curious tribute the only one he ever paid, de Vichy's corporatist legislation, which he says was not without attractions. But what vitiated by the fact what was vitiated by the fact that it linked to a regime born of defeat, the result was to push the masses towards an entirely different mystique. And this makes one wonder to what trifactor of ideas was uh, de Gaulle in favour of. 
was he in favour of liberty, egality and fraternity? Or was he in favour of work, family and the fatherland, which were the mottos of Vichy? To look at this in the abstract, it really does seem that throughout all of de Gaulle's iterations, because that actually doesn't seem to be that much in terms of a development of his thought, it does seem actually quite consistent in many ways, that I would say that Vichyism is very attractive to de Gaulle. There are many parallels between it. But again, what is his fundamental objection? It is defeatism. It is not necessarily the ideology. This gave de Gaulle's social doctrines a highly conservative, even some said fascist tinge. But another possible source of the association of the ideas were the writings of the French pre-Marxist socialists like Fourier and Proudhon, whose social thinking revolved around the idea of cooperation and social harmony, not of class struggle. And again, you can say Proudhon is the anti-Marxist. And again, maybe this is a French equivalent of uh, Prussian socialism. On one occasion, de Gaulle himself referred to association as an old French idea, defended by those figures generous, if not always practical, of goodwill and personal worth, who in the years 1835, 1840, and 1848 had developed what was then called French socialism. It seems unlikely that de Gaulle had any personal acquaintance with these texts, although his maternal grandmother had written a biography of Proudhon, but they were perhaps suggested to him by Louis Vallon, one of those RPF members who had become an enthusiastic for the idea of association. Vallon, among those several socialists who had joined de Gaulle in London, had in the 1930s been an economic advisor to trade unions. He provided a direct link between them and de Gaulle's social ideas. Vallon would have rejected the idea that the social doctrines of the RPF were fascist. He wrote in 1957 to thank de Gaulle. In 1940, the French could gain, have hope, again could have hope in their history. So I became a Gaullist. Since my youth, I have become, I have been socialist, and socialist I remain. The most committed supporters of the doctrine of association would come to call themselves left Gaullists. As far as de Gaulle was concerned, personally, his social ideas were also inspired by the pursuit of unity, which was one of his obsessions in relation to his constitutional ideas, bridging the conflict opened up by the revolution, or as he put it, reconciling the left to the state and the right to the nation, and in relation to his social ideas, bridging the conflict between capital and labour. It was also his way of giving greater intellectual weight to his movement, answering critics who alleged that the aims of Gaullism, as it developed after 1945, apart from bringing de Gaulle back into power and deforming France's institutions, were no more than an anachronistic obsession with national grandeur. Boris and Mendes France may have also failed to turn de Gaulle into a socialist in 1945. The resistance leaders may have come away frustrated that he did not share their belief that a social regeneration of France was possible. The doctrine of association was de Gaulle's, was de Gaulle's response. And again, you can say, as with uh, Nordin Siem in Vietnam, which is a, a may not seem relevant, but it is, considering that uh, Nordin Siem is that remnant of uh, French uh, Catholic thought operating in South Vietnam. We have personalism, Monnier's personalism in South Vietnam, and we have de Gaulle's associationism, albeit you can say it's a much, uh, actually no, probably not a broader church in terms of thinking of this, in terms of the unity in France and the unity of Vietnam, but very much, interestingly, inspired by the sort of same uh, intellectual kernels. But moving on, this is the underpinning sort of philosophy for which de Gaulle would be able to coalesce around in terms of providing an alternative platform for power. Soon after this, there are a wave of violent strikes, and de Gaulle anticipated that in the state of municipal elections, it would give him an electoral mandate to bring the RPF into power. And there were sizable advantages in the municipal elections, but not the national elections. All that was essentially left to the president of France, the then president of France, was to hold firm and then not call new elections. Instead, he relied on an array of centre-left parties that organised into a so-called third force. Nine successive governments whose ministers effectively played musical chairs, government by rotation, a government of the same faces. Regardless, this anti-charismatic, anti-personal form of government survived 
and it dealt with what de Gaulle had considered his ace in the hall, the threat of communism, and also in contrast to his prophecies around the collapse of the French economy, France was also the receipt of martial aid. And it is at this time that we have the, uh, the famous quote, 30 glorious years for France, in reference to the post-war Keynesian economic consensus uh, and uh, economic growth until the uh, OPEC crisis in the middle of the 1970s, uh, which is also the same situation for the German economic miracle and uh, consensus politics in Britain. So really it comes now to the corollary to that, which is he's still kept out of power, but we have domestic politics, and now we have to talk about foreign policy formation. We've already talked about, rather I've already talked about, but in reference to uh, using these other scholars, um, the aspect of decolonization defense of the empire, anti-communism, and the effects of the Cold War. But there is also another theme relating back to grandeur. Although the themes of RPF remained in 1951, the same as in 1947, de Gaulle's thinking on foreign policy evolved. In 1949, France has signed, the, um, signed up to NATO, despite a strong neutralist current in French public opinion, which sought that France should remain free of both the Western and the Soviet blocs. This argument might have appealed to de Gaulle, but he was persuaded by Aron, the uh, aforementioned theorist, that the communist threat made such a position untenable. De Gaulle was not entirely happy with the way that NATO was structured, but his position was that an imperfect pact was better than no pact at all. He was at this time committed to Atlanticism, but as the Cold War tensions subsided, he began to warn against the danger of French military dependence on America. By 1952, he was putting the existence of an American protectorate almost on the same level as a Soviet form of servitude, i.e. the Warsaw Pact, the occupation of Eastern Europe by the Soviet army. At the same time, de Gaulle's view of Germany evolved. France's hopes preventing the re-emergence of a central authority which had, uh, had failed once it became clear the Americans would not back such a policy. From 1949, Germany was divided by the Cold War into a Soviet puppet state in the East, with the non-Soviet bloc did not recognize, and the German Federal Republic in the West. De Gaulle realized that this development was irreversible, and the speeches from 1949 started to float the possibility of, as he put it, an accord between Gauls and Teutons and alluded to the need to rebuild the Franco-German Entente that had been shattered by the death of Charlemagne. In 1948, he told Pompidou, Supporting America at any price is not a cause. If only there was something in Europe. Europe has always been the Entente between the Gauls and the Teutons. And by that always, he's referring to the Carolingian Empire. 1500 years of French history, the Franks as representing Germans and Gauls, essentially a fusion of both, a uh, sometimes a cohesive and other times a uh, fractured concept of French nationalism, which both geographically united the areas of Germany and France and also united them ethnically. We all need at some point to place our hopes in Germany, hope that she can create a European mystique. I don't mean that one that needs to build a, Euro and a Europe against America nor against Britain or against Russia, but one does need to create a Europe. De Gaulle's policies in his Fifth Republic ten years later had already contained an aspect of these lines. So moving on, as stated, despite the formation of the RPF, de Gaulle will remain out of power for the next decade. You could almost view it as his Elba coming back to Napoleon. And de Gaulle, of course, being cognizant of all of these historical parallels, was aware of that fact, and it was a fact that he promoted. The saviour of France had retreated to his country idyll in Colombe, and he was waiting there for the call of his countrymen to save the country once again. And of course, the situation in order to continually save France as we've talked about the evolving nature of what essentially saving means, as far as de Gaulle is concerned, comes with the instability brought about by the Algeria crisis. Political instability was no novelty, so this is Jackson. Political instability was no novelty in the Fourth Republic. But the creeping sense of malaise had reached unprecedented levels. 
From the fateful day in February of 1956, when the socialist premier Guy Mollet had reversed his Algerian policy after being pelted with tomatoes by angry Pierre Noirs, the poison of the Algerian crisis was beginning to infect the entire French body politic. Politicians in Paris had less and less control over the army in Algeria. The military were more and more suspicious that the politicians were ready to cut a deal with the Algerian nationalists. Politicians had the hopes uh, of the resistance generation who had taken power after 1945, with such high hopes of moralizing French politics, found themselves implementing and condoning methods of oppression they had condemned during the occupation. Baudet, one of the former leaders of the combat movement, wrote a famous article in 1955 denouncing the French Gestapo of Algeria. François Mauriac, the conscience of liberal French Catholicism, was another vocal intellectual critic of torture in Algeria, while Pierre Mendes France resigned from Mele's government in 1956 in protest against the repressive Algerian policy. After Mele's government finally fell in June of 1957, his successor, Maurice Bourget Manon, heading the 18th government in the last 10 years of the Republic, lasted only five months. His successor, Gillard, had been in power for only three months when the Sakia crisis exploded. In the left centre periodical Esprit, one writer at the end of 1957 described himself as feeling like an exile in his own country, comparing the situation to 1940. For the first time since 1940, everyone is asking under their breath the question, does France still exist? And as means of covering a summary of the coup very quickly, don't worry, I will get into the uh, the nature of the Algerian problem as best that I can, because what happens is really quite remarkable. I want an ATF of Brumaire without the methods of Brumaire, de Gaulle had once remarked in 1799 as in 1958, French political elites had lost faith in the political system. They sensed that things had to change, but wanted to avoid either a monarchist restoration from the right or a return to the terror from the left. Napoleon was the providential figure who offered a middle way, but Napoleon had not taken power as smoothly as he had hoped. One of the two Houses of Parliament supported him on the 18th of Brumaire, but one of those two Houses of Parliament supported him. The other refused to do so on the next day. Soldiers were sent in to expel the deputies. In 1958, the threat of soldiers had been enough. In 1958, the choice was between a military coup on the right or the popular front alliance with the communists on the left. It was partly because he so mistrusted the communists that Malay had rallied de Gaulle as a lesser evil. Although the politicians were not sure that de Gaulle could be trusted to save them from the army, and the army was not sure de Gaulle could be trusted to save it from the politicians, any other options seemed riskier to both parties. Most successful coups contain an element of legality. Mussolini came to power in 1922, less because of the march on Rome, which could easily have been stopped, than because the king chose to appoint him as prime minister. The Italian elites no longer believed in their own system. The threat from the street in Italy in 1922 was probably less real than the threat from military in Algiers in 1958. Another precedent hovering over the events of 1958 were the legal vote of full powers to Bitton in July of 1940. Although some who voted for Bataan later claimed that they had felt intimidated, the army in Algiers in 1958 was certainly no less threatening than the army in 1940. Whether or not it is true that de Gaulle had said to Monneville and L'Entroqueur that he would leave them to have it out with the parachutists, the fear was at the back of everyone's mind. De Gaulle was able to legalise this coup because French elites had lost confidence in the existing regime to resolve the Algerian crisis. This was true of Molay, leader of the largest party in the Parlement, and Coty, President of the Republic. It was also true of the Chief of Defence Staff, General Ely, who resigned during the crisis, and the Prefect of Police, Papon, who had said that he could not answer for the loyalty of his police. De Gaulle was pushing at an open door. Cotty and Malay did all they could to facilitate his return to power, but de Gaulle did not make it easy for them. It is possible to imagine a different scenario in which de Gaulle publicly condemned the army's dissidents, which would have rallied a large number of politicians. Had he come to power in this way, it is hard to see how an army coup could have succeeded since the army had no plausible candidate to front its operation. The conditions of de Gaulle's return to power complicated his own position for the next four years. He had not created the overmighty army, but he had created a dangerous precedent reinforcing the army's convictions that it could bend Paris to its will. 
If he was ready to take the risk, it was because he was playing for high stakes. He wanted to come back on his terms, to break the system, not enter it. As he had told Temoraire in March, those who wanted him back had to understand that this would not just be another government, but a new universe. De Gaulle's skill was to have kept the Algerian rebellion simmering so that he could force the politicians to accept his terms, but not exploding to enable him to return to power legally. So what essentially is happening in Algeria? Well, going back to the previous map here, I've already mentioned the fact that there is a fundamental crisis in empire, a crisis that de Gaulle appealed to in 1947. As a result of many Algerian French soldiers participating in the war in uh, Vietnam, or rather broader Indochina between 1945 and 1955, we have many radicalized, somewhat communist uh, decolonists throughout the empire. There is also an evolving conception of what it now means to be a French empire. You can say that uh, the French empire goes through an evolving series of euphemisms. First it's the French empire, and then it's the French union, and then it's the French community, in the same way that uh, Britain transitioned in the 1940s between empire and commonwealth. So the same sort of a euphemistic sort of evolution was also occurring in France. The French had hoped, say, for example, in Vietnam in 1955 to keep the Vietnamese regimes on side until their influence was completely eclipsed by the Americans. But two crucial factors essentially affected the stability of France in the late Fourth Republic, and I believe were responsible for its downfall. One was the Suez Crisis. Uh, the Suez Crisis, of course, wasn't just a British debacle. It was a French debacle. The governments of both France and Britain had investments in the Suez Canal. Indeed, the French had been responsible for building it. And they, together with the Israelis, had basically backed against the NASA against NASA's attempt to nationalize the canal. But obviously the Americans came in and they sabotaged the arrangement. This caused major soul searching for the French. They had already lost a colonial war in French Indochina. Two years earlier, a organization called the FLN in Algeria, again, you can say inspired by all of these revolutionary ideas and also by the effects of the Cold War, which are now very much sort of uh, coming to the fore in terms of uh, the political sort of uh, makeup of the world, uh, launch a series of terrorist attacks called Red All Saints Day. This has the effect essentially of destabilizing Algeria and creating an atmosphere of terror. And the army responds, as has been brought up, uh, with a sustained protracted occupation and the use of the tactics of terror. Now, this was very much a psychological impact on France, because more so than areas like French Indochina, uh, which could be jettisoned through, uh, you can say, weaker forms of cooperation. Um, in fact, one of the reasons why the uh, Nodin Siem regime was able to uh, uh, take over and actually get rid of the um, Vietnamese emperor was because of his attachment to the French Union. Uh, no Din Siem was basically able to decry him as a French puppet. So all of these uh, collaboration regimes that the French had hoped to establish on the ruin of the empire, uh, one by one, are collapsing. But unlike equatorial Africa, which was, you can say, the heart of the free French resistance it's at Brazzaville, uh, de Gaulle had launched his manifesto. Algeria is a different case. Algeria was considered part of France. It was administered as a department of France, and it was essentially, for all intents and purposes, France. It was part of the metropole, as bizarre as that may seem. And indeed, it occupied both a symbolic and major strategic uh, position for France. Uh, it allowed France to essentially dominate the Western Mediterranean. It was the site of France's uh, navy um, in Mez al Kabir. Uh, it would later go on to be the testing site for France's independent nuclear deterrent. Um, and of course, there was an ethnic aspect to this. 13% of the population of French Algeria uh, were, not, uh, were not Algerians, they were uh, Pied Noir, uh, essentially uh, ethnic French. Um, and 13% is not negligible in terms of population, but nevertheless, the larger section of the population uh, were not ethnically French. Uh, they were Muslims. 
But the French argument essentially went that there was no such thing as Algeria. There has only ever been France. Um, the French had been there since 1830. And when the Americans contested the legitimacy of the French holding on to Algeria, the argument made in opposition to that was that French Algeria has essentially been, belonged to France before uh, Texas uh, belonged to America in terms of putting this in terms of longevity. So there was a huge psychological effect which linked Algeria more so than the other colonies which are rapidly gaining independence um, in terms of essentially seeing as a representation of the fall of France and the empire. The Suez Canal crisis had essentially off affected that great shock. And this was, you can say, one of the, uh, the turning in moments, as we see with de Gaulle, of fermenting the, uh, the fostering of uh, European unity. We have the Pact of Rome and we see what would later turn into the European economic community. Well, the British, which is fairly obvious, enter into a uh, increased period of American servitude whereas the French actually try and do something about it. There are, There is a suggestion at one point in 1956, after the Suez Crisis, that France and Britain actually opt into an, essentially a union, a political union between the two nations to avoid the collapse of the empire. Obviously, those negotiations never came to anything, uh, but such, if anything, represents the, uh, the desperation part of the two governments to hold the empire together. Despite the fact that de Gaulle had essentially situated his foreign policy very shortly after he had lost the uh, uh, presidency of France as head of state in 1946 on the preservation of the empire, and now he's becoming ambivalent to this issue. And so he was basically able to play both sides. What is obvious is that de Gaulle was essentially in his state of Elba in Colombay. He was expecting a crisis to propel him in terms of power. He had predicted that the Fourth Republic would collapse because it would suffered all the uh, all the issues which essentially paralyzed and doomed uh, the original Third Republic. It was simply a matter of waiting for opportunity for the events to take course. Um, in 1947, sorry, 1957, the army is positioning itself in Algeria to affect a stronger position in terms of dealing with the terrorists, dealing with FLN um, and the uh, Algerian nationalists. And they do so by effectively mutinying and directly um, attacking the authority of the French government. And they go as far as to actually turn Corsica, um, effectively establishing a a new state, as it were, in opposition to the French government. The French government could have either essentially devolved into civil war is the common argument, or they could have latched on to a figure who seemed to transcend uh, the divisions in politics in terms of a conscious ideology, but in terms of his role as a unifying figure going back to the history of the French resistance. And that, of course, is de Gaulle. And it is in those circumstances that de Gaulle reluctantly saw a large coterie of socialists and quote unquote rightists appeal to him to lead the French nation and he was basically able to do it on his terms. The stipulation was that he have full power to amend the constitution and the laws of France for six months, which is remarkable when you think about it in terms of a quote unquote democratic nation, that de Gaulle was essentially handed powers of an old Roman dictator for a span of six months during which he served as the president of the council. It is during this period that we see the drafting of the new constitution. But Algeria could have instantly destroyed the new Fifth Republic with himself as its first president um, because of all these conflicts that we're bringing up, the idea of the fall of the French Empire, the transitioning from the French Empire to the Union to the community, which was the euphemism that de Gaulle himself coined, the threat of the Cold War, the communists coming to power, but also, of course, the threat of America. America has already been referenced in terms of the uh, the overweening, say, for example, of FDR in terms of his opposition to de Gaulle, but of course the fact that uh, America had superseded French influence more or less in South Vietnam and in other aspects of the empire. So Algeria was a microcosm for all of the issues France faced. And of course, a competing castle for legitimacy, which is the authority uh, posed by the army. Um, the army had proved itself disloyal to the Republic. Uh, again, when I'm using rightist M. Smith, I'm very much using these in quotes. Uh, left and right are not very helpful in terms of construing hard political ideologies, um, which is why they're always evolving definitions. And when I use them, I'm always using them within a specific context. Left here, 
would align with the socialists and communists and basically be seen to be dovish on the question of Algeria. Right would be seen to be hardcore on the issue of Algeria remaining part of France, uh, even to the extent of actually deposing the government and creating a military dictatorship. De Gaulle was able to play both these factions, neither supporting one or officially condemning the military. And so he was basically able to represent himself as more or less defending the interests of um, Algerie Francaise. Um, but nevertheless, he only very tentatively makes that commitment. And unlike what we see in 1947, uh, he dances around the issue of Algeria. Um, it, it effectively it's a masterful form of dissimulation. Many people have essentially anticipated that de Gaulle had no idea what he was doing in de Gaulle, uh, that his flexibility was a simple, it was a, a form of improvisation uh, that it could have very easily cost him his presidency. But I think given the opposition he faced, like I said, on the one hand, the Americans are supporting uh, decolonization. They have benefited from the collapse of French Indochina and are now supporting the Vietnam War in what was formerly a French colony. The Americans have basically scuppered the French at Suez, and now they are also supporting effectively tacitly, giving a tacit approval to the Algerian decolonists, despite the fact that France is a member of NATO. Indeed, a point that I've made up on other streams, uh, made consistently along, across other streams, is that the Americans prioritize decolonization ahead of anti-communism. They prepare to weaken their supposed allies in order to gain new puppet regimes in Africa and across all the world, uh, something that de Gaulle was very much aware of. He tended to think, uh, you can say paranoid, um, in terms of uh, paranoid fantasies about the Americans uh, subverting the nation of France, but I don't believe that's uh, so far from the truth. But nevertheless, despite being given full powers as president of the Council of France for six months um, and creating the French Fifth Republic, which established a so-called semi-presidential regime with him as head of state and a government which was dependent on him, not on a parliamentary majority, as had been the case um, uh, in the Third and Fourth Republics, but more or less it gave him uh, carte blanche uh, to deal with foreign policy issues, albeit when it came to the intricacies of domestic issues, sometimes he would intervene, but he more or less conceded that right to divvy up policies and the minutia to his various ministers, albeit he would often intervene on various matters. But when it comes to um, when it comes to Algeria, what position is he going to take? Is he going to try and stand up for the integration of Algeria, uh, or is he going to lead it towards independence? And there were essentially three options provided to Gaulle from 1958 until 1961. Uh, one was integration, the idea that Algerian citizens, Algerian Muslims, uh, be afforded the equal rights of Frenchmen within the concept of Algeria belonging to France. Uh, such a policy was essentially put to the forefront by Leon Blum. It's this idea that it is French culture and not ethnicity or geography that is the predominant factor in what makes a French citizen. On the one hand, this was supported by those who wanted to hold on to Algeria and the Pied Noir who believed it would guarantee their rights. Yet on the other hand, securing that system of integration would have fundamentally altered the nature of France itself and would have made France officially multicontinental and multicultural. You can say had de Gaulle carried it off, France would have been able to uh, resemble far more, say for example, uh, Salazar's regime in Portugal, looser tropicalism, the idea that colonialism is in fact the bedrock of uh, Portugal's raison d'etre or means to identify itself as an independent power vis-a-vis -vis the Americans. The other form of association is something that I brought up, which is the idea of community. All the African nations existing in some, in some form of deferential alliance uh, to the French state. And the fourth option, the third option was independence. In terms of being able to understand the threat of the, uh, of the army during this time and the threat posed by the left, we have the week of the barricades soon after de Gaulle, um, de Gaulle essentially makes his uh, constitutional uh, reforms and he invokes emergency powers in order to put down uh, this early contest to his authority. And then from the army, we have the Algiers Putsch, uh, which is led by this um, figure that you see on the right here, uh, one Maurice Charles. Again, as we see in 1957, an attempt to contest the legitimacy of the French of the central French government um, by essentially appealing to a military strongman. De Gaulle was thought to be that military strongman, but De Gaulle was really not thinking like a military leader. He's very much thinking like a civilian leader, if not a republican monarch, which is very much the theme of this. Now, 
my theory is that being able to pit essentially the art supreme art of dissimulation i always come back to this bismarck quote which is to throw all contending forces in the air but only so high as the one can catch them again i really do believe that de gaulle did not care so much about the issue in Algeria and his thoughts later actually really confirmed this. He didn't even really care that much about the Pied Noir. What he did care was about France's strategic position. And this is informed by the Evian Accords in which the intention was that areas such as Mez al Kabir and various strategic sites in Algeria remain part of France uh, up, to, up to 1990 years. Um, but de Gaulle's major failure in the Evian Accords was the fact that so much momentum was behind the decolonizers in Algeria um, that his attempts essentially to reform democratic responsible government in Algeria and to maintain permanent concessions such as like um, Hong Kong and China uh, never came to anything. So in one respect, his, uh, his aspect, his Algerian policy was a disaster because he wasn't able to gain all France wanted from essentially assuring a territory that de Gaulle believed uh, was more expensive and um, wasn't worth essentially the risk, but also in terms of propelling all of these forces which deliberately contested his authority, which is the army and the Americans and the Algerian nationalists. So the fact that de Gaulle was able to manage the independence of French Algeria, betraying those forces who believed he was going to save it back in 1958 and not being deposed in a coup is somewhat remarkable. In 1961, the British Foreign Office actually looked at this and said, this is going to destroy de Gaulle. This is the end of de Gaulle's position as head of state because he was brought in to rectify this issue and he's capitulated. I actually take the opposing view because obviously that was complete, complete nonsense by the Foreign Office because de Gaulle would remain president for the next eight years. But what this does is essentially allow de Gaulle to consolidate his control within France. As for his perspective when it comes to the Pied Noir, um, he only tentatively allowed them to return to the French nation. He wouldn't allow the Algerian, essentially, militia who had supported the French uh, to join. And as a result, they were subject to severe reprisals. Some of the Pied Noir who stayed were also subject to reprisals. Um, indeed, you can say that this actually reveals a ethno-nationalist conception of de Gaulle's thinking. Why was de Gaulle against the idea of integration or was he so lukewarm when it came to the idea of Algeria? If Algeria became a strain and not an asset in terms of France's overall strategic position on the world, because he didn't want to integrate Algerians into France. He didn't want the Fifth Republic to essentially become a multicultural, multinational, multi-continental state as Salazar's uh, Portugal was moving towards. This was effectively a rebellion of French nationalism against Leon Blum's idea of civilizational French identity. And this could be explained by the fact that he believed that with hundreds of thousands of Algerians living in France, the return of the Pied Noir would have to lead to an exodus of France's Algerian population. So when there were Algerian revolts that broke out around them, if I remember correctly, 1961, uh, the police dealt with them extremely harshly. And indeed, there is an incredibly cynical argument regarding de Gaulle that um, the army was forced to retreat from Algeria if it could commit a massacre in Paris. But like I said, I view this as a period of consolidation, consolidation of France's imperial position, moving post-empire into something else in terms of representing France as grandeur and not simply as France as representing a colonial empire. But like I said, ultimately removing the military as a thorn in the side and contested authority. Because having 500,000 French under arms in Algeria was always going to be a source of uh, potential uh, uh, damage to your authority, regardless of how Algeria would have been able to remain uh, within the French Union. You're effectively creating a potentially hostile state, a dagger aimed at the uh, Fifth Republic. Um, so like I said, it's remarkable that de Gaulle uh, was able to hold all of these forces and remain in power. And like I said, as opposed to a period of disintegration, I see it as a period of consolidation with one major exception, which is the fact that the OAS never forgave de Gaulle for betraying French Algeria. And they launched a series of serious 
assassination attempts uh, targeting de Gaulle, um, one of which nearly succeeded. Um, but because again, quite rightly, the generals had expected de Gaulle coming to power would save French Algeria, and he was the figure most responsible for jettisoning it. But I think through the arguments I presented, it's quite understandable as to why de Gaulle felt that he had no choice. Now, the final article uh, for this evening is De Gaulle and the Death of Europe by one uh, Daniel J. Mahoney. And I hope to use this as a springboard effectively to talk about as many aspects of de Gaulle's policy of grandeur as possible, um, not just in foreign policy, but also in terms of uh, domestic policy um, and indeed economic policy. Um, it really is fascinating. And of course, this will lead us finally to the period at the end uh, of de Gaulle's um, uh, reign. I think that's more of an appropriate word, uh, which is the, uh, more accurately, one can say the revolutions in 1968 and the failure of de Gaulle's referendum in uh, 1969. So this is Mahoney. The politics of grandeur. If Americans think at all about France today, they do so through the lens of unexamined prejudice. It is widely held that all of, you, of all European states, France has least resigned itself to its diminished place in the world, that France also maintains a somewhat ridiculous and certainly irrational concern for its rank, even after ceasing to be a world power of any consequence. We Americans cannot resist but be a bit condescending towards France and its greatness, de Gaulle great statesman de Gaulle. While admired, he is often dismissed as the noble if irrelevant architect of France's anachronistic and annoying posturings. Putting all prejudices aside, let us try to articulate the politics of grandeur as de Gaulle himself understood it. De Gaulle is commonly perceived as both a Machiavellian realist and a starry-eyed romantic. Perhaps this common opinion in its confusion provides the best starting point for a presentation of Gaulle's politics of grandeur. De Gaulle undoubtedly shared certain first principles with the realist school. These include the recognition that the nation state as the contemporary embodiment of the political community is the central unit of international life and the indispensable instrument of statecraft. De Gaulle also shared with realists an untroubled acceptance of the role that duplicity and flexibility inevitably play in diplomatic conduct, as well as the keen appreciation of the balance of power as the means by which order and measure of, sociability, of soci sociality are maintained amid the competitive interplay of sovereign states. De Gaulle had a broad and deep, perhaps an obsessive historical memory. He quaintly called East Germany, Prussia and Saxony and he feared the reunification and revival of a centralized Reich, even a democratic and Western-oriented one. He wisely and nobly promoted France's reconciliation with Konrad Eidenauer, but he did not look forward to a united Germany in any form. Despite initial misgivings and hesitations, he supported the Atlantic Pact of 1949, partly out of anti-totalitarian conviction but mainly because he feared that the European balance of power was shifting dangerously in the favor of the Soviet Imperium. His rhetoric combined and oscillated between a genuine appreciation of the new ideological dimension of politics in the 20th century and a dogmatic insistence that what was really at stake in the Cold War was the age old and unchanging question of the European balance of power. He clearly recognized the totalitarian character of the Soviet style regimes, but was not convinced that the totalitarian or ideological character of the Soviet Union fundamentally affected its pursuit of imperial domination. This partisan or eternal France finally only saw eternal Russians at work in the machinations of communism and the movements of Red Army, going back to the idea that each nation has its communisms. This helps explain why de Gaulle supported the Atlantic Pact in 1949, but did not hesitate to undermine the ideological solidarity of the alliance after 1965. He unwisely took for granted that his countrymen would continue to recognize the totalitarian character of the Soviet regime and would therefore accept the necessity of Western solidarity. This neglect of ideology sometimes led to significant missteps on de Gaulle's part. He wildly overestimated the national and liberal character of certain post-Stalinist regimes, such as Golmukos or even Ceausescu's of uh, Poland and Romania 
respectively. He presupposed an American commitment to the rump of liberal East of liberal Europe, even as he pursued detente with the East and rallied against, railed against American hegemony. On the basis of all of this, one is tempted to conclude that de Gaulle was a realist in the worst sense of the term, sharing the realist school's unrealistic neglect of the ideological dimensions of statecraft in our century, but the truth is a great deal more complex. To begin with, in his pre-war writings, de Gaulle showed a detailed awareness of the historical specificity of the non-ideological statecraft of the old regime. Uh, someone in the chat is actually mentioning Rhodesia. Before I continue on this article, Rhodesia is actually a very interesting point here because this actually explains, you can say, de Gaulle's art at uh, dissimulation and possibly you can go as far as to say duplicity because de Gaulle would at once position himself after Algeria as the exponent of decolonization par excellence and the friend to the African states. Yet he would also show perhaps the most uh, dovish perspective on Ian Smith's government in Rhodesia at a time where the Commonwealth and the Americans had essentially failed to recognize uh, the government in Rhodesia. De Gaulle did not share the same sentiments when it came to Rhodesia. And in many ways you can say Rhodesia is the example had the army been able to effect a direct solution in Algiers, i.e. a French dominated minority state. Of course, he was ultimately able to assume control over the situation in Algeria and remove all the pertinent obstacles to his authority. Rhodesia essentially represented an alternative, but it wasn't one that he was ideologically opposed to, thus representing the apparent contradictions, you can say, all sublimated to this idea of French national interest and realism. To begin with, his pre-war writings, de Gaulle showed a detailed awareness of the historical specificity of the non-ideological statecraft of the Ancien Régime. In 1938, he expresses admiration for the Ancien Régime, the classical period of modern history par excellence. The statecraft of the old regime reflected a healthy balance between the requirements of self-affirmation and those of measure or moderation. It was a pre-ideological politics and policy of circumstances that eschewed abstractions and reflected a taste for the empirical, for concrete facts, for the requirements of the state. The European system of the balance of power established a self-regulating and limiting order of nations that rejected furious ambitions and inexpiable hatreds. De Gaulle recognized that the classical period of French and European statecraft had come to an end with the French Revolution. He appreciated that the mechanisms of balance of power, which continue to be a permanent validity for political life, is not always or necessarily accompanied by the measure of sensibility of the old regime, which aimed for a just proportion between the ends pursued and the forces of the state, and which self-consciously aimed, self aimed to avoid great national or ideological passions. Nevertheless, de Gaulle still believed that religious and ideological sectarianism poisons relations between nations and is a menace to the order of the world. So de Gaulle did not neglect ideological dimensions of modern politics, though he did decry it. His position is best understood as anti-ideological. His description of the contemporary world is fundamentally prescriptive in character. As a domestic statesman, i.e. a particular statesman of France, he wished to heal and transcend France's sectarian and ideological quarrels to overcome the long-standing division between the old regime and the revolution, to present one continuity of France, either 2,000 years or 1,500 year history, between partisans of both the monarchical and the republican iterations of France. He also worked for a transformed European order, where great and free and ancient nations could coexist within a common European framework. He saw an imitation of that future order in the renaissance of national sentiments in Central Europe, evident in the Polish and Hungarian uprisings of 1956. In retrospect, it is clear that he overstated the continuities between older and national forms and contemporary ideological states. He exaggerates the permanence of such provisional entities, such as provincial entities, such as Prussia and Saxony. And he seems to have taken for granted the solidarity and permanence of the nation state itself. However, unless we recognize this prescriptive character of de Gaulle's account of forces that move the modern world, unless we see that his rel relative de-emphasis of ideological considerations reflects a profound ide anti-ideological mindset and is itself an element of his statesmanship aiming to bring such a world somewhat closer, we will misunderstand and underestimate him. Right. Right. 
I'm just I'm just sort of scanning and uh, and sort of thinking as I thinking as I go along in terms of yeah. So that has basically outlined the duality and perhaps contradictions between de Gaulle regarding realism and his ideas of continuities and the existence of nations, not simply the fact that nations exist as actors, but the fact that nations act independently based on their own histories, their own particularisms. Going back to the idea that de Gaulle is focused primarily on history as the fundamental actor, and that ideology will inevitably become subsumed by history. That is his reading of the Soviet Union. What is remarkable essentially is his foreign policy regarding America and all the other powers of the world. So one factor, of course, is bringing into NATO and then again, becoming part of the European economic community. But then we have other facets of this. So hearkening back on this period of grandeur, the emphasis on France as a nation state and France now, as you can say, the national guardian of Europe. Britain had become the third nuclear power um, shortly after the Soviets and now in the 1960s, France affected its own nuclear power independent status. And you can say that to become a nuclear power, de Gaulle envisaged, uh, was to offer an umbrella to all of the other states in Europe in terms of looking to France for its protectorship. And indeed, you can say cynically that to be a great power is essentially to be a sovereign power, um, not essentially vulnerable to the whims of nuclear apocalypse by being able to essentially hold down the extremities and the expansionisms of the Soviet Union, but also even to a lesser extent, it could be said, America and to a much lesser extent, Britain. So within his conception of Europe, in his admonition against people like Jean Monnet, someone who had railed against him as being too pro-British back in 1940, he was against forms of supranationalism. He didn't believe that France could see itself as being part of a European super bloc. Rather, he believed, and again, it's sort of thematically interesting that we're going back to the previous stream, which is on Enoch Powell, which sees that Europe is a, is a pragmatic alliance based on nations. De Gaulle very much seemed to epitomize Europe and his conception in that same way. And the convenience about Germany's West integration and division of Germany was that artificially, Germany was now the weaker power compared to France. France could now project that authority, essentially, which had been lacking uh, since the early 1920s, when again, artificially, it had been able to impose a deterioris set deterioris settlement on Germany through the Treaty of Versailles. But even so, France's political predicament was very tentative. And it's very instructive here to actually look at the political situation of France in the 1920s and 30s and compare it to de Gaulle's imaginings. Because de Gaulle can seem incredibly sort of anachronistic, but what is incredibly perspicacious about de Gaulle is that he almost construes of alliances and pacts as almost being, in, in a sense, as natural and immortal and, to, uh, and eternal in terms of the actual particularisms of the nations itself. So Mahoney brings up the idea of Gamolka and Ceausescu as representing some sort of olive branch to de Gaulle. What does he mean by that? Well, the Soviets, of course, had occupied Eastern Europe after World War II, and they had divided essentially Europe into buffer states with East Germany essentially representing a Russian colony and indeed a potential sort of base of invasion if they ever wanted to expand westwards, albeit the issue is far more complicated here. And the Soviets were very sort of um, <laughs> frustrated uh, that they had to deal with the East German situation when it would have been perhaps more beneficial to have a neutral Germany and a massive amount of aid coming in from the West as compensation for jettisoning it. But nevertheless, we have all of these governments, Czechoslovakia, Romania, and Yugoslavia, now under a Soviet aegis. But when, and even Poland, but when de Gaulle is looking to these nations, he sees a potential restoration of the little entente, he sees that there is a possibility in Ceausescu, in Dubček before the Prague Spring of 1968, in Gomuka, even in Hungary, and especially when it came, comes to the example of Tito and uh, the non-aligned movement with Yugoslavia, that France can make inroads and not only detach those states from the Soviet Union, but also direct them 
at Germany, less Germany goes West Germany, less West Germany goes over and becomes too Atlanticized by prioritizing its alliance with America over its alliance with France, um, that essentially Eastern Europe can be used as it was in the 1920s and 30s uh, to threaten both Soviet communism and America. But of course, this was an incredibly imaginative, yet it was also an incredibly, uh, you, you can say ridiculous <laughs> uh, way of construing the world. I mean, there was, a, there was an aspect of genius in this and de Gaulle was quick to latch on to the ideological and political divisions and the contradictions in the Eastern Bloc, uh, Ceausescu and Tito being the most enduring examples. But when it comes to Gomuka, and unlike Mahoney, I, I don't really believe that Ceausescu totalitarianism would have bothered de Gaulle too much, given the fact that Ceausescu was a more uh, rabid um, nationalist, and I would say advocate of Romanian grandeur uh, than even de Gaulle was in terms of his own sense of fresh nat French nationalism. In many ways, you can say there was also parallels. De Gaulle never went out of his way to declare that there was a form of uh, protochronism i.e. that anything worth inventing was invented by Romania first, even though he said that France as an absolute reality uh, is beneficial to mankind um, in and of itself, and that its status as world power must be an essential factor of France as an emanation of grandeur. So, like I said, he is seeing the realities of the situation in various countries, which are adopting more nationalistic policies, which aren't ideologically determined, like Ceausescu in Romania and like Yugoslavia. But when it comes to Dubček, Dubček authority in Czechoslovakia is incredibly tenuous and, of course, is uh, quashed by Soviet invasion in 1968. So essentially puts paid to the idea that he can restore, de Gaulle can restore this idea of the little entente. Gomuka was also seen as liberal within the context of the, uh, the Soviet bloc, but he ultimately became as... Um, dependent uh, on the Soviets as any other leader, albeit both Poland and Hungary would have a uh, particular sort of idiosyncrasies vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union that they afforded in terms of the ability to manage the empire. But nevertheless, this should demonstrate, again, the balance of power on the one hand, but also the politics of grandeur, that France as seeking a national foreign policy is prepared to over is prepared to indulge all of these alternatives to an alliance with the United States and as he saw with Britain uh, prescribing it as a dependence or subjugation to the United States by appealing to all these various alternatives even if they don't necessarily work out he also de Gaulle promoted Africanism his African policy as being essentially fundamental to his post hoc justification as the great decolonizer after the Evian Accords, uh, which established the uh, the new sort of reality in Algeria. Of course, decolonization wasn't something de Gaulle was ever committed to, even though uh, left uh, Gaullists would say that uh, he was always, in some ways, an anti-colonialist. I would say he was an anti-colonialist in the same way that people on the right were skeptical of um, Salazar in Portugal, that there was an aspect of the French ethno-nationalist coming through in de Gaulle and saying France is France and France is Catholic and it's predicated on the 1500 years or the 2000 years of history. So in many ways, to connect it to the French colonial empire is an aberration. The French colonial empire, as we saw with Portugal, should only be used as an extension of France's power, of France's grandeur. But if the empire becomes a liability, then it is not beholden to us to have any sort of romantic notions about keeping it together for the sake of keeping it together, jettisoning it and allowing us to create a new order in Europe, which brings me to the question of Europe. De Gaulle had a very profound impact on the early constitutional settlement of Europe. He was able to prevent it quickly evolving into a supranational state by creating the national veto most prominently the French veto, and allowing it essentially to, form, uh, to adopt a confederative model, i.e. with the nation state being the primary, primary institution within the European Union over the Commission and over the European Parliament, albeit that distinction is very much being eroded uh, since de Gaulle was deposed. That was very much the conception uh, that de Gaulle had uh, created around uh, European integration, which he only begrudgingly accepted. And of course, it wasn't de Gaulle's proactive decision, it was de Gaulle's inheritance as the decision to enter 
the community have been taken uh, by the uh, Fourth Republic a few years before him. And this would also explain to my mind why he vetoed Britain's membership into the European community. My view has always been that he did so for a variety of reasons. Uh, one was purely economical in terms of the implications of uh, Britain's Commonwealth policy and the effects on uh, France's tariffs and the protectionism with uh, Britain entering. But there was another, you can see, more core component in terms of his uh, scepticism towards Atlanticism in the 1960s, which is that Britain as a supplicant to America would subvert the European Union in the interests of America. And that's something I believe actually is observable demonstrably observable, even up until the point of Brexit and beyond it. And as a consequence of this, de Gaulle vetoed the British entry into the European Union twice. Um, and again, as an extension of French interests, and yet almost represents a masterstroke for de Gaulle in terms of being able to inherit the European Union, which itself was in many ways an American idea, an American conception of transcending nationalism and basically creating an economic zone uh, for American cooperation, if not control. And he is able to turn it into a vehicle for French interests. And indeed, France at the head of the smaller bloc, i.e. the Benelux countries, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, Italy, and West Germany. France is the undisputed head, the first among peers within that smaller union. Um, and indeed, as the European Union gets larger, it naturally becomes more supranational in terms of its organization because the small, the nations within it become gobbled up and subsumed by the larger entity, which is very much the case there, albeit there is still an aspect of grandeur infecting Macron's foreign policy, which is the legacy of Gaulle. In fact, of course, he is the representative of that office that de Gaulle himself created. Someone has mentioned Quebec. I'll just come back to that. Another aspect of this is his Asian policy. And this, again, is where de Gaulle proves to be sort of remarkably prophetic. Having essentially dealt with the loss of French Indochina, de Gaulle believes that Vietnam can be turned against the Chinese and the Chinese can be turned against the Russians. Indeed, he is an early exponent of detente, an exponent of detente around five years before it would become official US policy of um, Henry Kissinger under the Nixon administration. And unlike with Kissinger, who you can say, again, he admired de Gaulle, um, who is advocating this from the point of view of pure realpolitik, de Gaulle is very much measuring this again with realpolitik combined with national particularism and his own conception of the national interest of these respective nations, that geopolitically it makes sense that China would come into conflict with Russia, even though the official split between China and Russia is ideological. It is the Sino-Soviet split over Khrushchev's quote-unquote revisionisms and Mao's desire to remain true to Stalinist doctrine, even though Mao was in no sense a Stalinist. And the idea that he was in a sense holding the flame of, of Stalinism is really quite preposterous. But such was convenient in order for him to drift towards the Americans and create an atmosphere of hostility towards the Soviet Union, essentially creating a third major bloc, the Chinese-led bloc, which led into the third world politics. I've already mentioned the importance of Africa uh, to de Gaulle's thinking and how the African policy of France is still something which is a factor today. Recently, Ni there was a coup in Niger and the positive relations, the aid and the connection with France's former colonies allowed it to tap into vast mineral reserves without having to be directly responsible for those nations. In the case of Niger, we're talking about massive deposits of uranium, which will allow for France's nuclear program, but also for France's transition towards nuclear energy. Um, so de Gaulle was essentially able to reap the benefits essentially of decolonization without having to directly administer these provinces. Indeed, when looking at one's when looking at his views on Lebanon, he essentially views these as two different worlds. He looks at the state of the colonial administration, and you can essentially view them two ways. You can say that there is no way that Lebanon will ever become France, or you can say that this is imploring France, uh, Lebanon to become more French. And you can say if there is to be an exertion or an effort to be made, it's much easier to realize that Lebanon is not France, and it's foolish to consider that Lebanon can ever be made France, which is why you can say that he's almost incredulous 
that Algeria can effectively be made France if it comes at the cost of integrating Algerian Muslims into the French Republic and turning it into from a metropole into a pluricontinental nation, imitating that of Salazar. Um, albeit you can say that Salazar and Catholicism it will be far more fundamental, but France, as a formerly secular state, perhaps to de Gaulle this would represent an anathema. Already he's presented with um, the separation of church and state, but the equal footing for Christians and Muslim would be a step too far in his battle essentially to retain an ethno-nationalist conception of France, limiting immigration and distancing itself uh, from the effects of the third world. Then we come to Latin America. In terms of, again, of the pursuit of anti-Americanism, de Gaulle goes on a charm offensive. He goes over to Mexico. He attempts to mend the rift between Mexico and France, which was created by Napoleon III, when Napoleon III invaded Mexico and established the Second Mexican Empire under Maximilian. And he uses his Mexican visit as a means essentially of trying to bring Mexico, bizarrely, um, in terms of the relative power and strength of the American economy versus the French economy, closer to the French orbit. And indeed, this is a factor that sort of um, is consistent throughout his Latin American policy. In the same way that de Gaulle is presenting himself as representing detente towards communisms, as the hero of Black Africa, he is now presenting himself as the champion of Latin American self-determinism against American control. This even comes to the, extre the extremes when we go to his example in Chile. He makes a state visit to Chile and he delivers an anti-American speech there. And to the confusion of the Chilean president, the Chilean president asks that speech really wasn't necessary. We actually have very good relations uh, with the Americans. I, I think weirdly enough, uh, in terms of <laughs> the de Gaulle effect, you can say, uh, this could almost be prophesizing, um, what's his name, Allende's uh, anti-American socialist regime in Chile and what the Americans would ultimately support in the Pinochet government. But uh, I think that's giving de Gaulle far too much credit. The other famous example is, of course, Quebec. And I mentioned earlier that de Gaulle would attempt to address the nations of the world in their respective languages, with the exception of England. The exception of being snubbed by the Great Power Alliance, the fact that France was not to be treated as a partner in NATO, but as a supplicant to the United States, in the same way that he's, you can say, dovish towards the Soviet Union in the Eastern Bloc and an early advocate for detente, um, he is perhaps most conscious of the idea that Germany is going to slip from France's orbit. And he especially sees this uh, with the end of the Eidenauer Chancellorship, uh, where he believes that um, the Franco-German alliance has basically been superseded by German Atlanticism. So if that is essentially the linchpin of France's policy, then it only makes sense that France be directed against Americanism and Atlanticism, and indeed, as this would extend to Britain's membership in the European Economic Community. So where does this play with Quebec? I believe Quebec you can almost say was a direct provocation. It was de Gaulle saying that France can and will intervene in the internal political makeups of quote unquote, the American sphere of influence of which Canada was very much um, in that situation in the 1960s. And um, you can say it was dramatic. It was a charade. It didn't represent formal French policy and it was derided by those in France. And of course it came to the horror of um, the American government as well. But nevertheless, it had an impact. It made de Gaulle essentially seem more powerful and influential than he really was. And you can say the magic of de Gaulle's policy of grandeur is that it artificially inflated France's power as the truncation of West Germany and East Germany also had the effect. A divided Germany affected French power a smaller European Union inflated French power. The ability of de Gaulle to go around and stir up the hornet's nest all across the world gave France essentially a moral legitimacy and an influence um, beyond that which can reasonably be expected of a country that was essentially second rate when compared to America and the Soviet Union. You can almost say that he is emulating Kaiser Wilhelm II, 
However, unlike Kaiser Wilhelm II, he combines drama with a hard core of real politic. He is Bismarck and he is the Kaiser. He is focused on Europe and he's also focused on Weltpolitik, Realpolitik, and the idea of France as a world power. Again, all of these contending forces, somewhat that would seem contradictory, like his African policy and his Rhodesia policy, but all have one consistent theme, which is the grandeur of France, which is the argument that Mahoney is making. So unless anyone in the chat says otherwise, I think that is a sufficient explanation of French foreign policy when it comes to the domestic politics of grandeur. It may surprise you to, um, to know that my sort of original background in history is actually constitutional history, uh, constitutional um, legal history. And the reason I drifted away from this is that it tends towards the view that uh, regimes are constitutionally determined, i.e. Uh, certain patterns, institutions, uh, formulations, powers divided between uh, legislative houses, semi-presidential republics, presidential republics, Westminster system politics, etc. All of these things are prescriptive when it comes to a proper operation of politics. And I have long since moved beyond that to consider first and foremost the personalities operating within those systems and the animating spirit that was behind the creation of those systems and how context essentially informs the implementation of quote unquote constitutional norms and processes. Um, obviously this was a way of being able for me to understand Britain's unwritten constitution or rather uncodified constitution. Um, I think this is actually also a good um, way of juxtaposing and being able to uh, form a realist perspective when it comes to understanding America's constitution, because many American scholars are simply, I would say, deluded when it comes to a case of trying to identify modern American politics with a case of constitutional uh, originalism, which simply does not exist, that America, like any other state, is not constitutionally determined, but goes through many as phases or, or turnings, um, such as the case with France. I don't believe Gaulle, de Gaulle ever had a legalistic conception. In fact, the whole conception of Gaulle as France, as France's, for all intents and purposes, monarch, is wedded to this idea of revolting around the ideas of base legalities, as he would consider them. France is to be found in grandeur. France is to be found in victory. It doesn't matter if the government is legally constituted, if it acts against the interests of France, and he will present himself against the quote-unquote legal government as France's saviour whether it be Pétain or whether it be the French Fourth Republic. So when it comes to the Fifth Republic, you can say, OK, de Gaulle is responsible for presiding over the creation of the new government, and that is his ultimate legacy. But I would say the Fifth Government was very much, the Fifth Republic was very much a vehicle, a vehicle for Gaullism rather than the other way around. Um, and as a result of it, the Constitution was essentially a evolving process throughout the entire 10-year term of de Gaulle. In fact, it's interesting that de Gaulle even didn't even fill uh, his uh, two year his, his two terms, uh, the seven-year stipulation. What is important to de Gaulle is not necessarily the particulars when it comes to the constitutional makeup of the Fifth Republic, rather that he has the power, he has the mandate to do what he wants to do, without parliamentary oversight, and he is basically given a free hand in foreign policy. That is what is so fundamentally different in terms of understanding the French Fifth Republic, as opposed to the, gosh, how am I, the 90 years of French Republican government that have preceded it, that the Fifth Republic is, in many senses, fundamentally monarchical, in that the head of state has control over foreign policy. This would contrast it with Italy or contrast it with um, uh, with Germany, uh, but also it doesn't have the strict separation of powers that we also see uh, in the United States. Um, the legislative house, or as de Gaulle see it, he very much considers to be uh, subordinate to the office of the presidency because the presidency embodies France, but again, the presidency is subordinate as an institution to de Gaulle. There's also a very telling comment to uh, Georges Pompidou, uh, his prime minister, and who would ultimately succeed to Gaulle as president, that uh, Pompidou, you may become president, but you will never succeed to Gaulle. 
like I said, the office of the presidency of the French Republic head of state simply being a vehicle for de Gaulle and not de Gaulle constrained by that office. And one of the most provocative and controversial elements of the new de Gaulle presidency of the French Fifth Republic is popular mandate. The original conception of the presidency of France since MacMahon had been to elect the president through the legislature. That, in a sense, almost created a anti-populism, a uh, anti-plebiscitary factor in the French political systems. And again, in terms of all these French politicians being historically aware, the reason to do so was to prevent the coup of uh, Louis Napoleon, as uh, Marx would refer to it as, where Louis Napoleon in 1848, who would later become Napoleon III, the emperor of the French, uh, was elected as the first president of the French Republic, only then to commit a self-coup and become emperor of the French. In other words, there was a demagoguery aspect, a uh, dictatorial aspect of appealing to a direct mandate over the institutions of the French Republic to the people itself. People refer to this, perhaps correctly, as Bonapartism. They also refer to it as Belongism. And Bonapartism is, I think, very apt in terms of understanding this because the office of the Fifth Republic has many similarities with the uh, evolving nature of the systems under the first French empire and the second French empire, the plebiscite being key. De Gaulle seldom essentially believed that uh, he should be confined by constitutional matters or by the evolving majorities in the legislature, albeit that played a, a role essentially in terms of him being able to implement his particular policies. But having a direct mandate and being able to say, for example, go over the heads and say, okay, well, I am going to appeal to a plebiscite to give me a popularly elected presidency. Such a thing was unheard of, and it caused resignations within his cabinet. But nevertheless, de Gaulle proceeded, and de Gaulle was essentially able to make the new government of France, something which it hadn't been since Napoleon III, uh, which is fundamentally presidential, and presidential based on the popular mandate. Uh, he was also responsible for the creation of the two election systems in France, uh, which allowed essentially people to vent and go for their preferred candidate in the first round. But you can say in terms of building around this Gaullist consensus of superseding factions, you go for the candidate you most want, and then you go for the candidate that you dislike the least. And that in a sense ref re respects the uh, RPF's original formulation, that we have parties, but then we have an umbrella movement which can embrace all of the parties. We have a particular candidate, and then we have a compromise candidate that sort of moves beyond there. And that, in, of course, has been the way that French politics has been conducted since, and one owes that uh, to de Gaulle. In terms of his management of the economy, as explained through the various writings here, de Gaulle was not enamoured of communism, and he was not enamoured of free market capitalism. Again, ideologically, as we can say even with um, Enoch Powell's adoption of free market politics, which he considered to be an emanation of British nationalism, i.e. nationalism determines the econ economic system, and not simply the blind adherence to free market forces that would infect Thatcherism. In de Gaulle, Establishing a separate economic system for France would again be an emanation of French nationhood, something to contrast it with what he would regard to as his adversaries in the game of competing nations. And so we see the concept of dirigisme, the idea essentially of a technocratic managed economy with free market elements. You can say that as far as the French are concerned, this is the legacy of the extreme centralization of the department, the creation of the office of prefects, them adhering to the mandate provided by the central government. Instead of providing a government by the politicians or management by the politicians, de Gaulle despises politicians in the same way that Bitton, his father figure, despised politicians. And so he appeals to the écoles, to the essentially the management schools of France to appeal to technocrats and non-politicians to get involved in the day-to-day -day running of the French economy and on a protectionist and state-directed level. And these policies are going to be continued with uh, Valérie Distant 
uh, national infrastructure projects, um, the nuclear program, etc. Um, this is the legacy of de Gaulle. But there is also another fundamental cornerstone of de Gaulle, which again bears links with Salazar and Franco. And the, the link between Salazar and Franco is not an invention on my part. Uh, commenters at this time were very much cognizant that this is a valid interpretation of de Gaulle's policies. De Gaulle turned France into one of the, essentially established for France, I believe, I could be wrong, someone in the chat correct me, uh, the world's second largest gold reserve. Establishing a gold reserve effectively allowed France to operate autonomously from the dollar. And again, in terms of being able to predict the power, <laughs> the predictive powers of de Gaulle, people are, are coming to me and saying that, uh, oh yes, de Gaulle predicted the uh, the collapse of the dollar. Um, and you can say the creation of a bipolar world, uh, of a multipolar world, which in de Gaulle's mind would actually theoretically benefit France had it not been the case that modern France has basically pegged its fortunes to the foreign policy of the United States. Having a massive gold reserve essentially enabled France to maintain an element of control over its currency and economic independence from the United States, which is why Salazar from the 1930s was also busy buying up gold in the way that Portugal could become an independent empire. So France at the head of Europe could also affect a policy against that of the United States. So dirigism, independence and the pursuit of gold. It's really be sort of beyond my remit to get into the intricacies of um, the economic system of France, but this comes to the consideration of where did it all go wrong? Why did de Gaulle essentially fall from power? Because de Gaulle was incredibly popular. In 1965, when he was re-elected at this new rejigged popular presidency, um, I'll, I'll look it up just, just quickly, but I think he may have gained something like 90%, sorry, 70% of the vote, um, something enormous. And this, again, is indicative of the fact that he was able to present himself to socialists and those on the quote-unquote right. Oh, no, slightly smaller. It's uh, 55%. But nevertheless, that's still a decisive victory. Um, and he was against uh, Francois Mitterrand. So how do we get to the situation of the revolutionary upheavals in 1968? Well, it's interesting actually to focus on Catholicism again, as I referenced earlier in many points in this chat. De Gaulle had a curious sort of reflection on Vatican II, uh, the ecumenical council that was taking place um, in the early 1960s, during which, of course, he was president. Of course, being a devout Catholic, he lamented the fact that the essentially the uh, the Latin mass was being put under strain. And in the same year he died, Pope Paul the uh, Paul the Sixth uh, would promulgate the Novus Ordo, the mass of Paul the Sixth, which essentially um, superseded uh, that of the Tridentine mass. And until Benedict the Sixteenth creates the ordinary and the extraordinary forms of mass, there is also the effect of um, the pill. A uh, contraceptive pill um, and the gallity of that in France. De Gaulle personally opposed the pill, but he was essentially um, uh, pressed by his government to assent to it. And it simply came to a matter does the French government actually finance the uh, distribution of contraceptives, of which he was adamantly in saying that uh, it was essentially antithetical to his own conception of um, uh, femininity. We go back to this idea of his conception of France as being a woman, his identification of France with the Blessed Virgin, but also with um, uh, various other figures reminiscent in French history. It is idyllic, it is a fairy tale, but it's also religious and spiritual. For de Gaulle, the advent of contraceptive pills effectively denigrated women into a uh, into essentially an instrument for sex solely. And so he reviled it on a fundamentally spiritual level. But all of these arguments are used to declare that de Gaulle was in some ways out of touch. I believe he was actually willing to, as we see with his legalization of uh, the contraceptive pill, uh, he was essentially forced to accept the inevitable in some senses and not adopt a doctrinaire Catholic position against this, given the fact that Paul VI also pronounced against contraceptives. And yet the official argument essentially for 
the student riots in 1968 is that de Gaulle was out of touch. Well, you know, of course he was out of touch in some respects. He essentially viewed these as uh, impudent children who had no sense of history, who were being radicalized by uh, left-wing uh, ideas of all sorts. Um, in fact, this is the main point I'm actually going to criticize Jackson's biography, uh, which was the principal source for this, for offering a very, I would say, banal perspective on as to why the uh, revolts of 1968 occurred. There is an element of um, de Gaulle's heavy handedness when it comes to this in terms of his ability to use uh, the force of um, uh, police power and military power to crack down on student protests. And this essentially f f fanned flames when the original uh, student protest began in 1968. What escalated from a student protest, which was essentially the argument stemming around quote unquote female bodily autonomy and the advance of far left ideas was an alliance between these forces and the Socialist Party under Mitterrand and the French Communists, which was still a factor to be reckoned with given the unexpectedly strong performance in 1965. We take these elements and then we add also a general strike of the trade unions. And it's at this point that de Gaulle fundamentally loses his nerve. I, I think there is also a point that he actually considers suicide, which given his uh, Catholicism is uh, totally abhorrent, as I'm sure people in the audience would be able to understand in terms of conceiving of that as an ultimate defeat. But de Gaulle had viewed this uprising originally as a bunch of uh, spoiled uh, ingrates, children, uh, who needed to essentially be slapped. Later, he adopts a far more nihilistic and conspiratorial view. In that same year, France and America had been renegotiating the terms of the bilateral agreement, essentially something to supersede NATO, whereby France would enter into agreements on a case-by-case -case basis, as, a part to, as opposed to being part of the NATO superstructure. So de Gaulle viewed it as incredibly suspicious that at the time where America is renegotiating its military alliance with France post-NATO, that there is suddenly something which resembles what we consider today to be a color revolution directed at the president who has caused you so much nuisance and so much embarrassment in your own turf, that is to say Canada, that is to say in terms of upsetting the apple cart with the European Union and Britain, and also in terms of Latin America. But there was also another factor. Since 1968, I think it's fair to say that American foreign policy towards Israel has, especially after 1973, um, slavish in terms of uh, support of Israel. What horrified many Israelis in 1967 um, is the fact that de Gaulle was considered to be pro-Israeli. He had a very good relationship with the first prime minister of Israel, Ben-Gurion. And also we have the example of French-British-Israeli cooperation during the Suez Crisis. But with the war in 1967, when Israel, in the course of seven days, goes on to occupy the West Bank of uh, Palis the, we the Palestinian West Bank, and then goes on to occupy the Sinai Peninsula, among other among other areas, De Gaulle takes an anti is stridently anti-Israeli line, and begins, funny enough, as Eisenhower would go on to in the 1950s, takes a pan-Arabist line against the advance of the expansion, essentially, of the State of Israel. So in 1968, a year later, de Gaulle is essentially viewing this as a Israeli-American conspiracy to topple the Fifth Republic and his presidency, to bring in a far more neutered and genteel president of France who would be prepared to act more as a supplicant, which is Georges Pompidou. Effectively, de Gaulle is believing that there is an international conspiracy and there is an internal conspiracy among factors of the left, but also factors of his own party. This also bears into um, consideration, I, I would say, a similar power struggle, which was between Anthony Eden, uh, Anthony Eden and uh, Winston Churchill in 1953. In 1953, Churchill, uh, I, again, my, my mind, he either suffers a heart complication or a stroke, and he's incapacitated. 
And this brings up questions of his longevity as prime minister, because Anthony Eden is jockeying to succeed him. Georges Pompidou has been an aide to de Gaulle now for nearly two decades. Uh, he rose from relatively obs relative obscurity, essentially to become uh, a figure dependent on de Gaulle. But in many ways, he's been able to uh, master uh, the political art of dissimulation and control the uh, French legislature and essentially act as that media as prime minister between the legislature and the president. And so he essentially believes that de Gaulle, uh, who is now, who is now uh, 60, 78, um, should perhaps concede power to Georges Pompidou. So considering all these factors, de Gaulle has essentially one option to stay and face the music or to flee. One option presented to him is that he retreat to Versailles. On another note regarding grandeur, just before I, I continue on this vein of thought, uh, Versailles was very much an instrumental aspect in his politics of grandeur. Versailles was the French window for foreign dignitaries and ambassadors to come, and uh, the more intimate association. Versailles essentially was for the rest of the world, but his more intimate association was, of course, at the House of Colombay. And the only world leader who he invited to Colin Bay was, of course, Conrad Eidenauer, which, again, is indicative of the uh, deepness of their relationship and the uh, sincerity of what was then the uh, West German and French alliance. But moving on in terms of the particular significance of Versailles uh, to de Gaulle and his uh, foreign policy, he essentially retorted that uh, Louis Philippe did the same and Louis Philippe was deposed. So de Gaulle does something far more dramatic which is de Gaulle doesn't simply retreat from Paris, de Gaulle leaves France. He goes on a flight and goes to Baden in Germany discreetly, and only after the fact do the other Germans essentially aware of what's happening. Now, de Gaulle did this for various reasons. The most uh, obvious example that comes to mind uh, is actually Ivan the Terrible, Ivan Grozny. For people who don't see the connection, uh, at one point, uh, Ivan Grozny um, essentially wanted to carry out a fundamental reform of the Russian state to increase the power of the Tsar, of which he was the first formal Tsar of Russia, or Muscovy, really Russia. And he threatened to resign and go to a monastery, which would essentially leave Russia without a Tsar or an effective leader. And having threatened to abdicate, the Tsar is brought back and essentially given carte blanche to do what is necessary to reform the state. And he goes on and begins a radical reformation of the relationship between the nobility and the Tsar. De Gaulle almost achieves something rather similar. It causes a crisis, a political crisis in France. And also for De Gaulle, it's a test of the loyalty of the army. And I think if there's ever going to be some sort of a contention to my point on uh, Algeria as being a process of consolidation of the presidency and the power of the French presidency and de Gaulle over the army, uh, this is the proof of that argument, which is that the army do not step in to launch a coup to prevent the uh, protesters, rather they appeal to de Gaulle. Georges Pompidou, again, appeals to de Gaulle while doing everything in his power to uh, counter the protesters. So what happens is essentially a coalition goading de Gaulle to return back to France and restore order. And not only is order restored, but the Gaullist parties, the UNR, go on to do extremely well in the elections, the municipal elections of, uh, of I believe, that year, 1968. But nevertheless, de Gaulle has secured his presidency He's been able to, you can say, fly in the face of what had occurred with so many regimes previously, which is that de Gaulle had prevented the color revolution. He had essentially secured the power of his office. He had proved that the army would remain loyal to the presidency. And if this was an American-Israeli plot, he had confounded it. Yet at the same time, it didn't stop the fact that Georges Pompidou had been a major figure in terms of ending the protests and the possibility of even civil war in France. And de Gaulle was incredibly, an incredibly sort of advanced age. And how long feasibly could de Gaulle launch into these grand, dramatic 
displays of policy, because of course, what's the theme throughout all of this? Impotence, schutzpah. Uh, de Gaulle is a dramatist. Uh, he is a politician par excellence. And essentially this is effectively having a toll on him. So having effectively restored and allowed for the longevity of the French Fifth Republic through his essentially mock abdication and flight to Germany and return, there are several competing arguments as for this. One is that he calls a, reformation, a, a referendum, a plebiscite, in the following year in 1969, as basically a referendum on de Gaulle, despite the fact his term isn't due to expire in 1972, or it's an earnest attempt to carry out that process of constitutional reform, which could focus on arguments revolving around this idea of Catholic association or personism, which I brought up earlier. And also there are the specific questions of the reform of the French legislature and in particular reform of the Senate. The issue here is that many believe that these arguments aren't actually relevant to the constitution. And this was simply a litmus test on Gaullism and the continued faith of the public in the continued presidency of de Gaulle and his ability to serve out a term into 1972, at which point he would be 82. And as a result of that, you can say the constitutional question being provided was intentionally vague. So as to what the aims are, we can really only speculate. And indeed, de Gaulle seemed to have already resigned to defeat before the results came in, which caused a narrow victory for the no in the referendum. And dutifully, he took that as a cue to resign. And he goes to Ireland. And ultimately, Georges Pompidou is elected in the same year, 1969. And the political system survives him. And that really is the, the end of Charles de Gaulle. I mean, I've talked so much about the mystique and the identification, but I will say, going back to a point I made earlier, that Georges Pompidou succeeded as president of the French Republic. He did not succeed de Gaulle. All of these deeper questions about France's role in the world, the politics of grandeur, and the evolving nature of the Fifth Republic as a vehicle for de Gaulle, not something for Gaulle to, Gaulle to be constrained by, is very much not a feature in the presidents going forward. Indeed, you can say that the 1969 plebiscite is the last experiment in seeing how far de Gaulle can go and build a coalition around using the constitution of the fifth republic as a personal vehicle for reform whatever that might be and the question in 1969 was incredibly ambiguous but there is also a question that a lot of people and not a lot, a lot of people are going to posit to me which is why didn't he restore the monarchy uh, he did joke at one point he referred to the count of paris for reference uh the comte de chambord dies uh, I think it's in 1881, uh, after which many of the legitimists uh, support the Count of Paris, who is the Orléans contender, the descendant of King Louis-Philippe, who was deposed in 1848. De Gaulle, again, you can say as a result of his uh, pragmatic royalism, he's not a hardcore legitimist in the case he's supporting uh, the King of Spain or another Spanish claimant, which would have... Uh, mucked around with the Treaty of Utrecht, but that's neither here nor there. He tacitly accepted that if there were to be a king of France, it would be the Count of Paris, who was not a, a Bonapartist either, and saying that a, a Napoleon should become emperor of the French again. Um, and the question simply put to him was, well, could you restore the monarchy? And de Gaulle's response essentially was, I did restore the monarchy. <laughs> and I think that is a good place to end this conversation uh going on for nearly four hours i'm actually enjoying i'm enjoying these uh these these longer streams it allows me to become uh, even more uh, dense and uh, detailed and uh, opine about these nature of the various politicians but as you can probably tell um uh i'm fascinated by de gaulle and uh, it was a real pleasure to research this stream and uh focus on the two things which I, I would say my strongest points on this channel, which is uh, conceptual history and uh, foreign policy, and indeed to understand the core breach between him and Patton.
if we are to look at this history as parallels um, between Piton and de Gaulle as representing two different conceptions of France, what separates Piton and de Gaulle is that de Gaulle will not countenance defeat or collaboration under any circumstances. And that is the essence, I believe, of grandeur. Uh, there is one super chat. Uh, because there's only one super chat, uh, maybe uh, ask me a couple of questions. And uh, just before I go, because you, you have me captive here, so uh, you might as well exploit me in that way. Uh, AA's evil twin, the Boomer Slayer. Oh my goodness, it's extremely generous. Um, uh, AA's evil twin, the Boomer Slayer. <laughs> uh, I also note you have uh, Basil the Second, the Bulger Slayer. Uh, as your thumbnail, so uh, I, I understand what you're doing there, Boom Slayer. Um, just a hundred dollars, incredibly generous, and thank you, and love your work. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Boom Slayer, or I'll call you Basil. Uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Kujo Kataro. Hey, um, uh, would you say De Gaulle was in the end a failure, or was his legacy simply not continue? I wouldn't say he was a failure at all. I would say. Um, he is a remarkably successful politician. I mean, I bring the other examples I brought up, the other French politicians I find interesting in the last 200 years. Uh, Chambord was never able to accept the call in the similar way that Napoleon uh, had Elba. Um, de Gaulle had uh, Combray. And uh, Chambord uh, had his exile in Austria. Chabot was never called. He never had that option to quote unquote save France. And so his aspect of being a Joan of Arc with the banner of the Bourbon monarchy, um, of course he was a failure and he was cognizant of that because he would not, like de Gaulle, be able to determine the affairs of France on his own terms. So in that sense, you can say there are many similarities between Comte de Chambord and you can say that there is a political link, therefore, between the personality of de Gaulle and his inherited legitimism as a result of the uh, cultural and political propensity of the de Gaulle themselves as Catholic legitimists. In terms of de Gaulle, he was successful in building a French political system which endures to this day. He was successful in reforming the European Union to suit French interests. He was successful in building up the gold reserves. He was successful in terms of building up a nuclear power. Um, as for his decolonization and the preservation of the empire, obviously that was a purported aim in 1947, but he was not an ideologically committed empire man. So he jettisoned it when he believed it was contrary to the interests of French grandeur. But if you're going to take a very sort of um, specific line and say, is France a world power? No, it is not a world power. Much of his foreign policy amounted to dramatism. I would say perhaps the death knell to his foreign policy was the Soviet occupation of Prague in 1968, because that stymied any of his attempts to wedge, uh, create a wedge between the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet Union, and use them as a new little entente. He was thinking very much in terms of the vein of French geopolitics in the 1920s and 1930s, and he failed spectacularly to resurrect their alliance because he undermined, I think, the resolve of the Soviet Union to impose what would later be called the Brezhnev Doctrine. But he did say something which was rather prophetic in that regard as well, that within 25 years, the aberration, which is this ideological system being imposed on the nations in the East will fall away. And of course, I think he said that in 1968, um, in less than 25 years, all of these countries will cease to be communist. So again, going back to uh, 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 de Gaulle sort of uh, panache when it comes to prophecy. So I would argue that there were definite, uh, definite aspects of failure. I think he took the uh, protests of 1968 to also be a, uh, a reckoning, a reckoning which will be reconciled by a yes vote uh, in the 1969 Reformation that was not forthcoming. Thereby, as he said in the article that I brought up by uh, Kritzmann, uh, that uh, the people no longer want de Gaulle, but they will remember de Gaulle effectively. So aspects of his legacy are enduring, still in French foreign policy, but I would say they grow dimmer every year. Uh, Macron, you can say, represents the most superficial aspects of de Gaulle. 
i.e. France carving out a preeminent position, but what what preeminent position as the first lackey of the United States? And that is something that de Gaulle would have found utterly abhorrent. So in that sense, definitely, his legacy was not continued. Uh, how important was the Paris massacre in French history? Um, I, I really don't know enough about it. I mean, as you can probably tell, this is nearly 100 years of history that there is so much. Um, there's only so much detail I can get into, I'm afraid. Uh, would you draw comparisons between de Gaulle and Talleyrand? Or would you draw comparisons between the potential instability of the Roman legions in Britain and the French army in Algeria? Um, in terms of the armies in Britain being withdrawn in 1410, uh, 410 um, yes, there is, there is definitely an aspect in which you can see Algeria as a process of withdrawal and consolidation rather than defeat. That's very much how I look at it. And not just in terms of leaving Algeria, but in terms of the presidency being able to subordinate the army. Like I said, I really do view that this is not a process of defeat so much as it's a process of the consolidation of the Fifth Republic. And what I would say distinguishes the Fifth Republic from the governments that preceded it is it was fundamentally anti-colonial and focused on the metropole. As for links between Talleyrand, well, obviously, I think the most latent example you bring up is Talleyrand's panache when it comes to uh, real politic and foreign policy and his uh, ideological flexibility. The difference is that Talleyrand was a committed revolutionary and was responsible for one of the uh, most uh, egregious acts uh, of the French Revolution, which was the uh, dissolution of the monasteries as goods of the nation, and therefore using the assignat as a way of essentially being able to uh, uh, create what, what essentially amounted to hyperinflation of France based on the value of uh, France's church and monastic property. But in terms of being able to conceive of France as a significant power, a potential power block to be used against Russia, and in terms of Talleyrand being able to get France recognized as a great power and to participate in the Congress of Vienna as opposed to being dictated by at by the Congress of Vienna. Yes, I think you can very much look at uh, Talleyrand in 1815 and look at him as a uh, de Gaulle in 1944-1945, albeit you can say Talleyrand was more successful. The fact that he got a seat at the Congress of Vienna, but uh, de Gaulle didn't get a seat at Yalta and Potsdam. Uh, who do you like more, uh, more Franco or de Gaulle? Well, you're just going to have to wait for my Franco stream, which will probably be out in uh, less than two weeks. All right. I've been speaking for nearly four hours and uh, my voice is gone. So all I can say is uh, thank you to the Boomer Slayer and for his uh, very generous super chat. And uh, thank you all very much for listening. Uh, this has been a very enjoyable stream for me uh, to deliver. So thank you. And just get the thing ready and goodbye.